Hello, we're on the Plata Day, high above saint laurier soulon in the Pyrenees for what should be the decisive day of the 2005 Tour de France. When the route was first announced last October, every rider in the race will have marked this out as the decisive day of the Tour. Six summits totaling 8,500 metres, spread over 205 kilometres of melting tarmac. Lance Armstrong, though, has a secondary and perhaps primary reason for wanting to win today. In a race that's constantly retracing its steps and paying its respects, stage 15 2005 is one that's heavy with meaning for the race leader. It'll be 10 years ago tomorrow that his teammate Fabio Casartelli died on one of today's climbs, the Col de Porte d'Aspe. The next morning, Armstrong stood with his teammates at the start, then rode with them across the line at the finish in a group tribute. Two days later, he paid his own with a brilliant solo stage win. The last time the tour came this way in 2001, he did the same. On this, his last ever tour, expect to see the full force of Armstrong's will to win on show today. And if he exercises it as expected, his seventh tour victory could be all but secured. Chris Boardman, this is the day he's marked out to win. It's tremendously difficult. He's the strongest man in the race we've seen so far. Will this be his first stage win? Well, today's going to be a very, very difficult day. He really has to concentrate on the overall first and foremost. I wouldn't be surprised if his, his chances are spoiled by a large breakaway, but it's all going to happen near the end. Uh, certainly the motivation is there, but it's really going to depend how the rest of the day goes. But there's personal motivation, as you say, but he is ruthless enough, if it comes down to it, not to let sentiment get in the way of his overall victory. That's what he's really looking at. Well, if there's one thing that Lance is good at, it's prioritisation. And today, first and foremost, is to win the Tour de France. Secondly, if he has the opportunity, then for sure he will take it. All right, what about his rivals? We've seen several of them have a go. Vinokurov has a go every day, although he yo-yos off, off the back at the end of it. Is anyone strong enough to attack him today? Well, I think this is the day that CSC really, have their last chance, we saw Basso, he really gained confidence yesterday. And I think if anybody's got the legs left, uh, T-Mobile yesterday, perhaps CSC today. All right, well, before we join the race, let's have a look at the way the overall standings are coming into this stage. Armstrong has a lead of 1 minute 41 over the man in second place, Michael Rasmussen. Then it's Ivan Basso and Jan Ulrich in the positions in which they finished last year's tour, 2.46 and 4.5 and minutes back, respectively. Levi Leipheimer and Floyd Landis make it three Americans in the top six. Mansebo, Clurden, Vinokurov, Moreau, Yaksha and Cadell Evans round out the top dozen places. Let's have a look at the stage profile. The Porte d'Aspi, the first climb of the day, then four first category climbs before the final one to the finish, which bears the special beyond category designation. Well, if Lance's intentions weren't plain enough already, they were spelled out today at the start in five letters. Fabio was the single word on the armband he pulled in, and so far he's been riding safely in the group. They pass the Casar Tele Memorial on the descent of the first climb, and he'll be back there, incidentally, on tomorrow's rest day to take part in a small ceremony. Now, while the bunch were pacing themselves for this marathon day, a group of 14 riders broke away. That is now down to six. George Hincapi, Lance Armstrong's teammate, is one of them, and they are on the fourth climb of the day, the Col de Pay Resort. Armstrong's group is now less than 14 minutes behind them. Let's get over now to join Paul Sherwin and Phil Liggett for live commentary. A beautiful day in the Pyrenees. It's a day for a battle royale here. Only six survive from our original 14. We are midway up the climb of the Col de Pere Sword, and the gap is coming down. It was nearly 20. It's now almost 12 minutes. And these are the six front runners. Armstrong is in a group behind, and his team are still strong. Well, Phil, if you're in a group like this and you want to blow your morale out of the back window, all you have to do is lift your eyes up, and that's exactly what Michael Bogart is doing. He can see the summit of this climb, and he understands and he knows because he's been here before. He knows just how long it's going to take to get up there. It's a horrendous climb now because there are no more trees and you can actually see the road zigzagging up to the top of this mountain. 12 minutes, 48 seconds now, so it's coming down pretty quickly, but it's a long way to go yet. We've still got two more climbs to go after this. Pereiro takes a drink. It's about 45, 46 kilometres from the finish just now. The heads and the shoulders and the backs are now starting to bow down to the pain that is being given out on the slope of this mountain and this is Michael Bogart he's going to the back I think he should be fine he's probably just going back to take on board a drink
but in fact it's at the front Laurent Brochard who's been riding himself at the back of this group seems to have recovered he's going to go and set the tempo now that's not a bad thing to do because it's a lot more comfortable to ride in a situation like this at your tempo not the tempo that is given out to you by somebody else Armstrong there has got three teammates in front of him on the front I would expect it to be Chechu Rubiera just behind Jose Acevedo behind him it's Yaroslav Popovic as one or two of the team cars are stopping a little bit further back you can see the damage that is being done by Team Discovery Channel after the initial work was done by Team CSC I'm not sure where Paolo Salvadelli is but he does have the ability on the descent of the Col de Pirasur to come back and now you can see how quickly that time gap is coming down at the start of this climb it was 19 minutes lead now it's 12 and a half just looking down there who's going to come next we're waiting to see who will be the next rider to come up here and as you can see there's an awful lot of riders and big chunks of time being lost by everybody here on the slopes of this mountain I didn't see Paolo Salvadelli, and I wonder if he's gone back completely. I think he has dropped back, Paul, and, you know, this gap now down to 12 and a half minutes. There's the very select little group, this now. Mansebo is still in it, so too is uh, uh, Christoph Morrow in the green jersey. On the other side there, peeping through, is Ivan Basso. He started the action to bring this break down, but it looks as though Lance's team is about to finish it. Well, they always rise up for the occasion, don't they? This is Azevedo on the front from Portugal. Behind him is Cecu Rubiera from Spain. Behind him is Yaroslav Popovic from Ukraine. And what a, an incredibly multinational team, Team Discovery Channel, have put together. Michael Bogard doesn't seem to be enjoying this climb as we get slowly and surely up to the summit. But if we just pull back here, Phil, you get a chance to see how far it is to go. And poor old Alan Davis must be thinking, what am I doing here? Well, he's just taking it easy, saving strength for the two climbs still to come. We are hearing that, in fact, uh, Jorg Jatsk and Cadell Evans have just about rejoined the yellow jersey group of Armstrong. So that's been a bit of a struggle, but it might indicate they've slowed slightly for them to get on. This is the breakaway here, riding very, very strongly. These are, they cut out all of the other riders. There were 14. These are the climbers now and this climb is a brute and as you can see a very popular climb with the crowds it's such a well-known climb in the Tour de France the Col de Pere Sword bit of action by Bogart he's trying to stretch Pereira and get them away well that's funny because a few moments ago Bogart was right at the back of the group but he has managed to I think ride himself through a bad patch you know in a race like this three weeks long there are days and there are sometimes moments for a few kilometers you feel really bad in a race and if you can ride through that normally you can get yourself back to a certain amount of form as we can see the gap is still continuing to come down now that is a sight for sore eyes one kilometer to go to the summit yes and indeed and they've only got to see that two more times before the finish today as Pereira leads the charge towards the top of the Perusord Pereira leads there and looking down they will be able to get an idea of just exactly where the main peloton is because this is such an open climb here at the summit of the Col de Pere Sword and they would be able to see the cars and the excitement around the leaders of the tour. Hincapi looking very comfortable he's been sitting on this group as a passenger because he will be under orders just to stay there this is possibly the very good joker in the pack for Lance Armstrong here this afternoon because he has got a man who's been in the breakaway all day and hasn't had to use hardly any energy at all. I suppose we could say the same for T-Mobile as well for Oscar Sevilla, but I don't think Oscar Sevilla has got the great form that made him a possible Tour de France winner a couple of years ago. That's Eddie Mazzolini there in the dark blue jersey, just sitting on the back of that group. The Italian Mazzolini is pretty high overall, 19th at the start of today. But it really is remarkable. Twice in this year's Tour de France has Armstrong been isolated in a critical moment of the Tour. Once was on the road to Gerard Mare when all of a sudden there was a big attack from T-Mobile and then there was not one grey and blue jersey around him to protect and pace him to the finish. Again, the same thing happened yesterday and that was on the Côte de la Payère. All of a sudden T-Mobile came out and attacked and Armstrong was once again alone. I wonder if that's going to be the same today. The determination of Armstrong is more com uh, concentration at this stage, this uh, stage, I think. It's very much concentration. He knows, Phil. He's ridden these climbs so many times. He's dominated on these climbs since 1999. 
But here this afternoon, I think he's got something special in the bag for us down towards the end. And that gap is slowly but surely still disintegrating from that leading group, which was 14 riders, but is now down to just six. They will cap the summit of this climb in a few moments' time. These riders, in fact, have not got to the completely open part of the Col de Perisord, so they won't be able to see and judge the distance between themselves and the leaders. Well, just slipping to the back for a moment here as we see Calcioli take a drink and quickly get back into the action. He's been riding very well. It's the first time we've really seen him. We were expecting to see him much earlier on in the mountains than this. It's now inside at 12 minutes. Armstrong's group is still pacing its way into the picture. And there's still time, you know, because we've got the Col de Val Laurent and then we've got the Clyde to the finish. Armstrong knows that finishing climb. He's won on it before. He knows just how hard it is. Well, he was the last winner on the slopes of Pladadea. And, you know, if you have put as much energy into a breakaway as these guys are, you are going to have a horrendous time when it comes down to the last climb of the day, the Pladadea, which, you know, although, Phil, it is only, and I say only, 10.3 kilometres in length, it's an average gradient of 8.3%. But at the bottom, it really is a beast because it's 10%. And it's like looking at a wall right yeah. in front of you when you come at it. Horrible sight indeed. And after all of the climbs they've been over, their legs must be screaming with pain. Whatever's wrong with uh, Coccioli here, he's dropped back to have another word with the team manager, probably Roger Leger or Serge Boucherie. Over the top of the climb we go. Somebody's and gone I, over the top. Yeah, I don't know who it is, I must confess right now. But somebody has it's just Russia. jumped away. Brochard. Long, long Brochard, the missing man from the group here. He'll be the first over the top. Being chased by Michael Bogart. And there he is, Laurent Brochard. Well, Brochard knows this area. It's very close to where he got a stage win in the Tour de France in 1997 in Ludonviel. He wasn't really, I don't think, going for the points there. I think he was hoping to open up an advantage and maybe take the advantage then of a very dangerous, precarious descent off the slope here of the Col de Pere Sword on the way down into the town of Ludonviel. Call the pair of sword. Hola, soy Alberto Contador y el tour vuelve después de la publicidad. Welcome back. The lead group of six riders has gone over the top of the Col de Pere Sword. The Armstrong group is still climbing towards it. And Chris, where do you expect him to make his move, or in fact anybody else to make theirs today? I think uh, really the next climb is where it's all going to happen. Uh, if, it, if anybody's got a chance of genuinely going for the overall, it has to be in the next few kilometres in this tour. All right, the Col de Val Laurent Azé is the next climb up. Then they've got the Or category climb up here to the Plata Day at saint lary sous -Lon. At the moment, they're still climbing to the top of the Col de Périssord. Let's get back out on the road and rejoin commentary. We'll call this the elite group here because all of the stars of the Tour de France are in it. But today, six riders are still trying to stay clear. They are 11.26 ahead on the road just now. Uh, but there are some good riders in this group and good riders who've had bad days are holding today. Well, Chris Orner had a terrible day yesterday. He was well up in the overall classification on the previous day. He was 28th place overall, but yesterday, Horner lost himself 29 minutes and 8 seconds. But then I suppose, Phil, that's not really surprising after being in a 200-kilometre breakaway the previous day. No, he tried to win and he was caught at, what, 250 metres, maybe less from the line. That's the look of the day. Well, the amazing thing was he, in fact, still finished right up there in the sprint down towards the end because he tenth. crossed the line in 10th place. 10th, still sprinting, and they went past him and got the first nine places. How unlucky was that? Robbie McEwen, of course, the Australian, getting his third stage win. He was in tears. He couldn't believe he'd succeeded in getting that stage win. 1 the 34 now to Alan Davis, who's still trying to get on terms, and they're 13 minutes back to the main field. You know, I can't believe looking at George Hincapie here, Phil, you know, at the back end of the group. Hincapie has been a professional since 1994, and you know he's still only 32 years of age. For many, many years, he was the youngest rider in the peloton. Hincapie enjoying his meander through the Pyrenees this afternoon because I would have to say of this leading group of six riders, Hincapie there has obviously had the easiest ride so far. He's sitting on the back of the group and the reason for that is he knows that his teammates are behind and 
they are the guys who are doing all the tempo setting. On the front, Michael Bogard in the orange jersey of Team Rabobank. Pace changed there by Piotr Coccioli. Coccioli, a man who in the past has been a serious hope for Italy as a contender to finish high up in the overall standings in a lot of the big stage races. Finished eighth in the Giro this year, but a couple of years ago, I think it was back in 2003, he was in fact in 2002, he was third overall in the Giro, and that's what made them think that Calcioli was a guy who could possibly one day win a Grand Tour. That's right, so is a gamble. I, and we're hearing now that is an abandoned rider, and it looks as though it is going to be Kretzkins, who's gone from quick step, I think. If I heard the number rightly from Race Radio, Wilfred Kretzkins has gone from quick step. Another rider who played a big part in helping Tom Bonham win stages two and three, but Bonham, of course, long since gone in the tour with his injuries from crashes. Quick step now down to just five riders. Uh, it'd be pretty lonely at the dinner table at night for Michael Rogers on the quick step squad because uh, alongside him there still only remain Cerves Carnarvon, Patrick Sinkiewicz, Bram Tanking and Guido Trenti. It's going to be a long ride for them on the road up to Paris. And sadly, their team sprinter, Tom Bonin, crashing out of the tour when they came in with very high hopes that he was going to be the winner of the Green Jersey points classification, which is currently worn by the Norwegian Tor Hushoff. But that's a battle that will continue once the race goes on to the flatter roads. Well, there's confirmation then. Poor old Kretzkins has now uh, left us. It was his first Tour de France as well, Paul. So we've lost a few couple of first-timers today with a Herrero going as well. Leipheimer looking very comfortable at the back here. Four Americans in this leading group. Chris Horner just in the front there. Amazing how his Tour de France this year, Phil, has been up and down. He was on the attack one day. Yesterday he lost 29 minutes, and today here he is once again with the biggest names that the sport has to conjure up. And there you can just see that Jorg Jaks did recover and managed to get himself back into contact with this group. And that would probably mean, although I can't see him from this altitude, that Cadell Evans has managed to come back to the group as well. What a little group now, about 21 riders, I think, that is. Yep, just 21 riders, and as they go over the summit, they're still looking at 43 kilometres to go to the finish. They've got a long descent down into the town of Ludonvielle, and then they start the penultimate climb of the day, the Col de Val Luron Azé. Look at that. That really is a tremendous climb that these riders have to face up to. 11 minutes and 15 seconds, so the time gap not coming down all that much in the final few kilometres, and it certainly would not change, I don't think, on the descent down into Ludonville. But if they want to pull back those leaders now, they're going to have to start really cranking it up on this next climb of the day. There's the summit. It's Cecu Ribiera on the front. Yaroslav Popovich in the dark glasses and the white jersey as leader of the best young rider. Over to the left-hand side is Jan Ulrich. He has never, ever finished lower than fourth place in the overall classification at the Tour de France, and there are not very many records that are quite as good as that. He started off with a second place in 1996, and that was to his own teammate, Jana Rees. He came back the year after and won it, and since then, he's had a dramatic series of second places. That was Cadell Evans just peeping through there around the back of Jan Ulrich, so Cadell despite having a little bad patch in the early part of this climb, has managed to come back to this group, which contains all of the top men in the overall classification. Can't see that anybody so far is actually missing. <laughs> so we're in trouble here, Paul. I couldn't remember the rider making the pace in the front, but it, they, I was just saying they pulled back here almost five minutes now. Uh, on this climb alone, on those six leaders. Well, that's Chechu Rubiera on the front. He's doing much. a great job. The man behind him is Jose Acevedo, and, of course, the man who's very easy to spot out in the white jersey is Yaroslav Popovic. So Armstrong has still got three very strong allies on his own team here up alongside him. As we notice, Cadell Evans has pulled himself back into this group. We're going to have a major sort out, I think, and yes, it is down to 11 minutes and 15 seconds, but you see the wind that is starting to get up on the summit of these climbs, yep. and actually looking out from our finishing line commentary box, you can see that the wind is blustering into the riders' faces for the finishing straight. Well, officially now they're saying they've gone over the summit, 11 minutes and 30 down, there were 16 at the bottom, there's two climbs still to come. Oh, boy, that makes a lovely picture, but not for the riders in the Tour de France today. A vicious, vicious stage indeed. The six front runners, though, will still feel they have a chance here. 
Well, I think the riders in this group would certainly only want to see those mountains on a picture postcard. Certainly wouldn't want to see them as the profile of the final of this stage as we now head down into the valley of Ludonville. Well known to one Laurent Brochard, who's in the leading break because he was a winner of a stage here in 1997. But they've got 11 minutes to lose, Phil, over the next two climbs of the day. It's going to be tough. Bonjour. C'est Sandy Cazard. On se reverra pour le Tour de France après les publicités. Oscar Pereira is the man with the most to gain. He started the day fairly well up in the overall classification. He started in just 24th place with a gain of 10 minutes. He would climb up to 15th place overall, but I think he's going to lose a huge chunk of this advantage down before the end. Hincapi is the second place rider in this leading group. He's 25th at the start of the day, with four minutes and 59 seconds in arrears. But they don't seem to have that pedaling style of riders who are looking at the wind this afternoon. They have the pedaling style much more of riders who are just hoping to survive. They currently have a lead of 11 minutes and 15 seconds, but we are climbing up to one of the most legendary climbs of the Pyrenees. We'll go over the summit of this one into the valley, and then the showdown will certainly begin. Well, it's still a warm day here. Hint of snow in the far distance. We don't quite get to that snow line today, but it is a tough day out for these riders. Severe not working that hard. The number four there, George Hincapi, not helping them at all because all of his teammates are here trying to catch up and bring Lance Armstrong into the race. Armstrong not in danger of losing his yellow jersey at all at the moment because there's nobody up the road nearer than 24 minutes overall overnight. But even so, Phil, I still feel in the back of my mind that he wants to win this stage. He wants yeah. to finish his career in the Tour de France with a, a piece of panache. He won this stage last time we came here. He caught Laurent Jalabert, who'd been in a long breakaway in a situation like this, almost three kilometers from the summit. But Laurent Jalabert had no more gas left. Now, this is a bit of a surprise because, in fact, we can now see that Oscar Sevilla hasn't got the climbing legs feel that he had a couple of seasons ago. He has not. I thought he was sitting in the back waiting for the moment to make a move. But here goes Oscar Sevilla in all sorts of trouble here. This is a surprise. It reduces the power of that lead group now uh, to just five riders. Now, Sevilla has not won a race since 2002. His best days were when he raced with the Kelme squad. And he just doesn't seem to find that, that sort of form again. Well, he's found something, Phil. He's actually pulled himself just to the back, but I think the writing is very much on the wall for the man in pink. The man from T-Mobile, the man who was basically brought into this squad to look after Jan Ulrich in the big mountain passes. Pereira swings off. These riders now, I think, have got to the state of fatigue where all they can do is just tick the pedalers over and ride at what is a very slow maximum for them, and they will know that behind, the race is starting to unfold. Well... This is Pereiro on the front, and this is, uh, with him, is Pietro, Pietro Cauchioli. The pressure again on the breakaway. Well, actually, me saying that they weren't riding all that well, the advantage is just nudged up to 11 minutes and 45 seconds, which is a bit of a surprise, because when I look at the rhythm and the speed in this group containing Lance Armstrong, I have a hard time understanding how that leading group of six is actually extending its advantage. It might only be by 15 seconds, but at the end of the day, that 15 seconds might give the victory to one of those men in that leading group of six. I'm still waiting for the big explosion to come, and I'm convinced it's going to come on the final climb, and somebody is going to try and leap out of this group, because the platter day for every rider in this group is probably going to be the situation of a time trial, an individual time trial, 10-kilometer test of strength, inner strength on the slopes up to platter day. This is the best support that Armstrong's had as we go back to the Tête de la Course. Laurent Brochard now has tried to get himself to falsify company with this group that he's with. It's down there. Uh, it's up to, I should say, 11 minutes and 54 seconds. But that was just a testing of the waters, I think, by Laurent Brochard. He got himself 1 meter 50 off the front end of the group before sitting up and allowing them to rejoin him. You can almost see the difference in the speed, and I'm really wondering as to whether or not these six leaders are going to survive. 
They've got six kilometres to go to the summit, but six kilometres on a climb like this, instead of about eight minutes it would take you on the flat, it's going to take these men around about 18 minutes. So that's Rocha. Good style. He knows this is a big chance for him this afternoon. Big George on the back, just sitting there. And I wonder if Hincapie now is trying to factor into his mind how is he going to win this stage if they don't get caught. He's not the strongest sprinter in the group, but theoretically he should be the best rested rider in this leading group of six riders because he has hardly done anything at all to contribute to the success of the move because he has been in a defending position as a teammate of Armstrong. 11 and a half minutes when they came over the top of the Calder Pera Sword. They, they're catching back, Paul, but not very quickly at the moment. I think they probably took a lot more risks on the descent, actually, than the group containing Lance Armstrong and the rest of the favourites did. Because if you look at the tempo they've got here, they actually don't look all that fresh. And we must never forget that these men have been away since the 27th kilometre. This man we're looking at here, Oscar Severe, they used to call him Babyface. He's such a young-looking rider as we go to the front of the group and see that it's Oscar Pereira who is the most nervous in the group. I got a gut feeling that if this was to survive, the man who might win the day would be George Hincapie, and he's never won a stage in the Tour de France in his career. Well, that would just be the icing on the cake, and this is clearly a plan too. If Lance Armstrong can't do it, then George must try his best shot. He's getting the easiest ride of the group. As the gap has gone out now, it's gone up by 45 seconds since they started the climb of the Val Laurent, so there is a little bit of a turnaround. They might take encouragement from that. Remember that when we get to the top of this mountain, we are only 23 kilometers or about 14 miles to go. Most of that is downhill, and then the last 10 kilometers are up to the summit at Plata de Pereira. Looks very nervous here. He knows this is a big opportunity for him, and he wants to try and reduce this break in numbers. And I think if he could start riding alone, then he would feel there's a big possibility of the success coming to his team, Fonak. But there still has to be a battle from behind, Phil, because the riders in the yellow jersey group have got to try and find themselves a place in the overall classification before we ride now over next week through the Massive Central. Well, two riders have gone out of the race today, David Herrero and Wilfred Gretzkins bringing the field to 158. This very select group is 21 strong, containing Armstrong and the principal rivals in the Tour de France. As we now look here at the rear of the group, that is Christophe Moreau asking for drinks. He was third and plummeted out of the leaderboard yesterday. Uh, Christophe Moreau, and he missed all of the moves. No longer a challenger for a podium place in Paris. But he's back in the right move again today. Well, you look at the speed, I really can't believe, Phil, that that group of six riders off the front is going to survive because that speed is incredible on this flat road running up to the bottom of that climb, the final penultimate climb of the day. And it looks to me as if Paolo Salvadelli has recovered. Well, he's got back in, that's for sure. He's having food at the front, good for him. But the gap is going up. Hola, soy Iván Mayo, más del Tour en dos minutos. The Tour de France on ITV, sponsored. Welcome back. No change on stage 15. That lead group of six men is still climbing towards the penultimate summit of the day, and the Lance Armstrong group has just started the summit behind them. 11 minutes or so. Chris, you think if people leave it until the final climb today, it's going to be too late? I think so, really. It's got to be now, and for me, my, my money would be on Basso to have a go. We've seen Sastra moving to the front and working hard, uh, and I think he could be trying to set himself up, but it's got to be lower down the slopes. It's not a long climb. All right, and the longer they leave it, the more that six-man group has a chance of producing a winner today. Let's get back out onto the, ra uh, the race, out on the road now, as we see a CSC man dropping off the group. Here's Phil and Paul. Bobby Julik, just uh, latching on to the Armstrong group, has now been unlatched because he is getting dropped again. Rough day for Bobby today, and he's having a great Tour de France. Finished third in 1998 overall. Well, this year he's in 16th place at the start of the day, but I think this season he's had the best form of his career. Another man who came back and we never saw on the descent is the climber from Italy, Giuseppe Guerini, no. as Sastra now disappears. 
Well, Sastre again did his maximum, and he's gone as well. And there's the champion of France there, Pierre Federigo. And it looks now as though it is time to start losing Savadelli. The pace has gone up. Savadelli, working very hard, has gone back. This is Andreas Cloak who's in trouble. Well, I tell you what, I've seen the mountains and the damage done, but the damage is certainly being done here this afternoon, and we've still got two climbs, well, one and a half, I suppose. This man was second overall in the Tour de France last year. Andreas Cloden is eighth overall, and he's losing a big chunk of time because he's still got Plata Day to come. But this is a steep climb, the climb of Valeron. There's Carlos Sastra. He was the one that lifted the pace. You can feel the steepness of that corner and the legs aching as they go around it. Cloden has gone. As we move up now, it is going to be a rider here uh, from Uscatel. Uscardi has gone through. It's Gibeldia. I'm surprised he made the move yesterday. He's tried again today. He's cracked again. Well, this is a blow for the Basque people who've come here to see their team, to support their riders on the slopes of Plata Day because further downfield from the commentary position, it is almost a sea of orange. They will cheer that rider even if he's not going to win the stage. The next man to get popped off is Stefan Goubert. Goubert, who's a real promising rider, but not today. He also says goodbye, the Frenchman. And now we've got another major casualty here as well, because this is Alberto Contador. Well, he's a developing rider, a rider we'll talk about in the future over the Tour de France, and he stayed in that group for a oh. very long time. Around the corner, the next man to go, it looks like Jörg Jats. Yeah, it must be. There's no more left for Liberty, is there now? As we see these riders, you can feel this climb, just how hard it is on these hairpin bends. And it, we'd like to get to the front now and see who's lifted the pace. Absolutely horrible, this climb. It is a very rough surface on the road. You feel now as if your body and your wheels are getting stuck to this road. Cadell Evans is there. Look at Christophe Moreau, mouth open, gasping for breath. The psychological thing for these riders, Phil, is they know it's hard here. Uh, and all of them know how hard it's going to get. If Cadell Evans has learned anything from his first Tour de France, it's how to hurt himself, because he has showed tremendous courage. Uh, it was also Chris Horner on his left shoulder there. Now we're looking from the helicopter. Boy, this is a select group of bike riders now. Team Discovery Channel on the front. This time it's Jose Acevedo, the Portuguese rider from the squad, who's decided he wants to whip up the place. But here is Alexander Vinokur. Off oh he's dear. coming. There'll be trouble now because this man will lift the pace. He never knows when to say enough is it enough is enough. Alessandro, he's the champion of Kazakhstan, by the way. He's looking over, just seeing, and I think it's an acceleration. This is going to cause, I think, a depletion of possibly Discovery Channel again. Well, it's got rid of this man, number 12, Curini. It's got rid of Francis Moreau, oh, Christoph Moreau. Carino's, Carini's gone. Well, this is the pressure and the acceleration of T-Mobile. I wonder if he's trying to leapfrog over Andreas Cloden, his own teammate, who's about a minute and a half in front of him in the overall classification. And that's the first in discovery, or is it the second? That's Rubiera who's gone. Chechu Rubiera, job done for the day, and we're not going to have very many riders left with this pace, Phil, at the top of this climb. Let's move more and further forward. Moreau's that's Moreau. Gone. You can tick them off now because this is the move to try and reach the leaders. It had to come on this climb because the last climb, they will need to make the progress. Ulrich is poised and Armstrong is in the right position. Chris and watch Co out Mansebo on the far right. Chris Horner has gone. Discovery Channel have not quite lost all of their riders yet because Jose Acevedo is still sitting on the back of this group, but only by the skin of his teeth. The Col de Val Leron is proving to be the decisive mountain on today's stage. This is Cadell Evans now. He's also unhitched. He's refound Moreau. They're going to try and work together. It's going to be tough to get back. Alexander Vinokurov, uh, Jan Ulrich, Ivan Basso, and now Lance Armstrong saying something to Acevedo. But they haven't got rid of Rasmussen. They have not got rid of the man who lies in second place in the overall classification. Acceleration now from Ivan Basso. Ulrich responds. So does Lance Armstrong. There's somebody on the right here. I thought we saw Acevedo, but maybe I was wrong. Now, this is the acceleration from Ivan Basso looking over to see what kind of damage. You can see Acevedo actually disappearing in the distance, his job done for the day. And in fact, there's a gap here. Ulrich cannot hold the pace of, of Ivan Basso, but he gets the big diesel oh. engine going. Another kick from Basso. Armstrong must respond to this. And he's gone round Ulrich, and I'm not sure Ulrich has the power. These are the big three of the Tour de France. And now it is Basso and Lance Armstrong and Ulrich. He's struggling, but he's catching up.
This is almost an action replay of yesterday. The three big men. Here is Karsten Kroon. He's been caught. And look at Basso. He wants to win here in the Pyrenees this afternoon. He's got Armstrong right on his wheel. And Ulrich again, Phil, because of that big gear, the massive gear that the German turns over, he cannot respond to these accelerations of the men who can climb mountains fast. Well, Basso is now trying to race himself into second place. This is Yaroslav Popovic. His job is done. He'll try to just stay in that white best rookie jersey now. This is the chaos on the climb of Val Laurent and Michael Rasmussen. His second place is now in serious danger. That's Eddie Mazzolini. He's high up in the overall classification. Started the day in 19th. He's gone off the back. But, you know, just looking through the chaos of the cars here, I can see that Alexander Vinokurov is still in contact with that small group. Two men now. This is the face. This is the mask. This is the big match day for Lance Armstrong. I knew and felt, Phil, this morning at the start he was going to do something special. He's been waiting for this to happen. Looks over his shoulder. He has the presence with him of Ivan Basso. And Ulrich is gapped. Well, uh, the way Armstrong looked there at Basso, he wants Basso to stay with him. He needs Basso at least till he gets to the last climb of the day. It's two against one just now. Ulrich has just got a fraction of a gap between him and Basso and Armstrong, but he won't give up. I think Jan Ulrich this year has got the best Here position he he's ever had at the Tour de France. He's got the best condition. He's prepared, but the problem is he's had an awful lot of bad luck. Phil, he crashed the day before the prologue. He had a nasty crash on a descent on the road down into Mulhouse, but he has suffered through it. He hasn't complained at all about his accidents, and he's still the third strongest man in the Tour. I've never actually heard Jan Ulrich ever complain, and he's had some serious criticism against him but look at that he showed us a great day yesterday he's fought back into the picture again Basso seen him come on a little bit of an acceleration just to try and hurt him once more as Ulrich gets on I think he's lost ground again well, Ulrich is a battler. This is the next group on the road. Vinokurov struggling to stay on the back. That's Leonardo Pipel in front of him. Levi Leipheimer in front of him. Floyd Landis again. But Alexander Vinokurov, Phil, he has no fear at all. He doesn't care about what's happening in the race. All he wants to do is attack and create damage. Well, that's Vinokurov now sitting behind. That's Levi Leipheimer sitting behind Floyd Landis. Floyd Landis sits behind Rasmussen. Rasmussen is losing his second place overall. There is no doubt about that at the moment. As we're seeing the riders coming clear, this is an amazing break at the minute, but they're really turning the screw hard. They are really turning the screw hard. A lot of riders battling to try and get themselves back into this race. Francisco Mancebo is a long way back. He's the man who started the day in seventh place overall. But what is happening here is the toughest three men in the Tour de France are in the three premier positions. Ivan Basso, Jan Ulrich and Lance Armstrong are locked together in what has been a very private battlefield over the last three years. Ulrich is the man to hang on, Lance Armstrong is the man to try and fly. These three unbelievably superb athletes in the world of cycling, they have been rivals for years and here they are, locked together in battle, all of them too proud to say I'm tired and I've had enough. Well, you know what, Phil, it is actually almost a little bit sad to see this because this, I feel, is going to be the final showdown. The three great men who have dominated the Tour de France over the last few years and someone's coming Man back Sabo. there, Man Sabo, yeah, Man Sabo, chased by Landis, Rasmussen, Leipheimer, Leonardo Pipoli. Well, does anybody give up in the Tour de France? Apparently not, because they just suffer and try that little bit harder. Here is now Alexander Vinokurov trying to get back onto the group with Leonardo Pipoli just ahead. This is Armstrong. Well, Armstrong's hiding nothing now either. He wants rid of these boys. There is nothing he can hide. There are no more teammates left to pace him. It's all basically him against Al Ulrich and Ivan Basso. His face now is getting himself into that zone where he will concentrate. This is the kind of concentration that he applies when he rides time trials, and he rides time trials very fast. Let's not forget there are six riders somewhere up the road. There's a bit of debris in between as well, and these boys are riding at just over nine minutes now behind the leaders, which contains Hincapi and Michael Bogart and Pereiro still. Here they are, chance to have a look at them. This is uh, Hincapi, sat at the back as he's done all day long. He's there for Lance Armstrong. He won't help. 
he won't help at all. He's just sitting there and waiting to see how the race develops. And I think the most important thing for Hincapie is when it comes down to the end, what he wants to see is whether or not Armstrong comes back because he knows if Armstrong does come back, he will still be there to help him out. And think about that tactically. If this group of three riders manages to catch all, uh, Ar Hing uh, Hincapie, <laughs> well, then Hincapie's got himself into a nice tactical situation to help Lance. It's an incredible move and it's working so far. Michael Rasmussen here fighting for his second place podium in Paris. Ivan Basso has started the day one minute and five seconds behind him overall. And right now he's ahead of him by a few seconds. Landis has never ridden a Tour de France as good as this. Mansebo has clawed his way back into the action. All of these riders are not going to give up without a fight. They are pushing themselves to their ultimate limit. Well, we're looking at the six leaders, and they've already lost a couple more minutes of their advantage because it's actually now just slipped down to nine minutes, and Hincapi is still sitting there looking comfortable. Well, we're looking now at these riders, these six leaders who've been at the front of today's stage of the Tour de France since the 27th kilometer. They're inside of 500 meters to go to the summit, and they've still got a nine-minute advantage. Theoretically, on any other day, that should be enough, but I'm not sure that it is going to be enough here this afternoon because I think we are going to see an immense pursuit of the slopes of the Plata Day. Vinokurov has recovered. He's managed to get himself back into contact with Pipoli, Mansebo, Rasmussen, but Rasmussen here could be seeing his second place in the overall classification disappear. He started with a minute's advantage over Ivan Basso, and right now he's going to have to do something special. He's lost 35 seconds of that, but we've still got an unbelievably difficult climb to go to the summit of Luzardiden, of, of, I should say, Pladade. Pereiro, he's the strongest rider in the group, but this man over on the left, Laurent Brochard, is the most tactically intense rider of the group. He knows about this area. He's raced and won here before in the past, 1997. He's looking to get himself points in the King of the Mountains classification, which he does. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him continue on the descent because he's also one of the top descenders in the sport. He doesn't have that many points. The points in the King of the Mountains classification is Michael Rams Ramsmussen with 174 points to Christophe Barros, 89, and Santiago Botero's 88. On the descent, I don't think they'll take too many risks, but they dare not lose too much of their advantage because over that last climb, they lost themselves quite easily two and a half minutes. And that goes to the five minutes they lost on the previous climb, and the biggest climb of all is still to come. 8.56 now to the Rasmussen group, 8.27 to Lance Armstrong to the leaders on the road. Armstrong is trying to finish this off with a last big showdown in the Pyrenees and he's only got two men to worry about. And the two men that have worried him for the last number of years, Armstrong, Ulrich and Ivan Basso. Basso actually looks very comfortable there. You can see him tickling over those pedals very nicely, nice and calm. These, Phil, are great champions that we are looking are. at here this afternoon. You know right now there is no tactics. These men are all giving everything because they want to have a big showdown on the final climb of the day. And they don't want that showdown to be for seventh or eighth place. No, we have to be absolutely honest and say these are the podium in Paris. And that's the way it should be. It may not be the way it turns out. But they are showing themselves to be the best three bike riders in the Tour de France. And they are working together now. You saw the arm flick from Armstrong. That's come on through and do your bit. Ulrich never hesitated. He must be hurting. He must be hurting because he is not the greatest of climbers in that leading group of three riders, but he probably is the most talented and, at the moment, the most courageous. This is the next group containing Floyd Landis, Levi Leipheimer, Vinokurov, and, of course, the man who is in second place overall, Michael Rasmussen. He mustn't panic in a situation like this, Phil. He's not ever been in a situation like this where he's been so high in the overall classification. But if he panics, he'll push himself into the red zone and he will crack on the final climb and he could see himself losing four or five minutes. Well, we'll see what happens. There are still one mountain day to come, but it's a flat finish. This is the day they must race for the time. There may not be such big time gaps on the Tuesday when the race resumes. Armstrong paying attention to the fluids. Keep the fluids topped up. The face not giving anything away. Looking to the left, looking to the right. 
almost like a vulture looking to see where the prey is. He's, look at the pedaling style there as he gets up towards the summit. That is a banner indicating 25 kilometers to go to the finish. And the 25 kilometers to go to the finish will probably leave him at around about two kilometers to the summit of the Col de Vin Laurent Azé. Ripping away, looks over his shoulder, where are you? Come on, Jan, if you want to move up into a podium position in Paris, you better work with me because we can build an advantage here over the man who lies in second place. This was looking very much like a great podium. This is the kind of riders that Armstrong wants to climb onto the podium with, I think, when he gets up to Paris, because none of them are getting rid of him at all here. And Jan Ulrich never shirks the pacemaking at the front. There he is, giving everything he can to that big old diesel engine. They can't be that far from the top. The clock continues to count. The latest gap is around about seven and three-quarter minutes. They are closing in. Look at the top of this climb here, Phil. It is absolutely melting because of the heat and of the pressure of the cars coming up here. Just caught a glimpse there of a rider from Sonnier Duval while well, he was about to get caught as the group here now goes through the banner indicating 20 kilometers to go for Oscar Sevilla. I think that was probably Bert Rubens Bertoliati who was about to get caught by the Lance Armstrong group. But these guys are now on the final descent of the day. They're looking to go down into saint Larry. Life is all up from here, and what a way to finish above saint marie Soulon. You can sit in this little town and just look at this mountain, and it would frighten the pants off you. And that's where we're going now after a day like this. 205 kilometres of torture. That was Bataliati. He has been away in the break for ages. He's now coming back. The break, though, is around about seven and three-quarter minutes for the Armstrong group. There's only three of them. This is, looks like uh, Andreas Kloden coming back to the group, recovering to try and pull him. No, this is Sevilla, who's actually trying to get himself back to the six-man leading group. He's had a hard time, Sevilla, here this afternoon as he gets down into that rather precarious aerodynamic position. This actually helps you to pick the pace up to around about 100 kilometres an hour if you're going downhill in a straight line, as we are just now. Well, he's made it back to the leaders and hats off to him. It should be just in time to go off again when the climber plan the day starts, but he'll be there into the town of saint Laurie now. It's quite a long way down to the valley first. Oh, boy, how fast did they just climb at that climb of val Laurent and the three strong riders. They were hiding no more. They came out and showed their strength. This is the twist, and that's quite a nasty descent here through the town, round the church, all but the way round the church. Very tricky, very precarious in the straights, though, you know, as we go at 18 kilometres to go, which is around about 12 miles of racing. In that straight, just a few moments ago, we recorded a speed of 62 miles an hour. Not bad on a push bike. Well, I'm glad they slowed to get round the church. Armstrong, Ulrich and Basso here. The man behind is coming back from the breakaway, which is uh, Vitaliati. He won't be there too long, I don't think. Look at his face, though. He's trying to hang on to the elite of the world of cycling. This man is trying to hang on to second place overall in the Tour de France. And Michael Rasmussen with Floyd Landis, with Levi Leipheimer. They are the riders here now who are trying to get back on terms. This will be Eddie Mazzolini, and he's with Christophe Moreau. They're a little bit further down, but they might race back up to that group. They might do, they might be able to take a few risks on the descent. In fact, it looks very much as if Eddie Mazzolini here has made contact with Christophe Moreau. Moreau could keep himself in the top 10 overall by the end of today, but I shouldn't think there'd be any change at all for Levi Leipheimer and Floyd Landis because the only men in front of them in the overall classification are actually in front of them on the road. There's the face of Christophe Moreau, once a winner of the prologue time trial in Dunkirk. His stage win was then in the Tour de France. He's had good form this year, the best we've seen him ride for an awful long time. He's still on the climb, don't forget, of the Val Laurent, as they all are, except the six men have gone over the top. Not far to the summit, though, for the Armstrong group. And Rubens Battagliati gritting his teeth, he's staying with them at the moment, which is amazing. Well, that's a great souvenir for that guy because he's not one of the great climbers of the sport, but what he will be able to say one day or another in his future is, I went over the summit of the penultimate climb of a Tour de France stage with Lance Armstrong when he was on his way to winning the title for his seventh time. But when they get to the Plata de Phil, he's going to pay for the effort that he's putting in here just to stay in contact with those three stars. Well, good chase by Moreau Mazzolini. I'll say Moreau Mazzolini has followed here. That's Pipoli there who's in the leading group, and so too Yanislav Popovic, so they're getting together. Meanwhile, up at the top, 
Ulrich goes over the top with Basso and Armstrong there over the top now. The Togliati still there. We're looking at Ivan Basso, we are looking at Jan Ulrich. The time gap is 7 minutes 40, and now they've got to make a big descent, and they'll be left with the climb of the Bladder Day to try and reach the leaders. It's going to be very difficult, Phil, over these last 25 kilometres of racing to bridge that gap of 7 minutes and 40 seconds. It all now really depends on the freshness of the six riders in the front of the race. In fact, another man who's recovered rather well here to get back into this group is number seven there, Yaroslav Popovich. He had to do a lot of work in the early kilometres of this climb for Lance Armstrong, but he is very well defending his lead in the best young rider competition. He may well be the star of the future. Well, the most concerned rider here is the King of the Mountains leader, the Dane Michael Rasmussen, as he comes up towards the summit of the climb. And we'll do a quick time check on that for you if we can, but he's, uh, he's just over a minute behind overall, Ivan Basso. And Basso is already plunging down the mountain with Armstrong and with Jan Ulrich. Time to take a little bit of paper up the jersey there to stop the wind in there through the lycra as you go down at 100 kilometers an hour. Well, just look at this for a descent. This is an unbelievable descent. And actually, Rasmussen at the top of that climb, Phil, had lost himself one minute and five seconds. So actually, he's already lost second place overall to Ivan Basso. Hi, I'm Dennis Minchov. You can see more. Welcome back. Well, somebody had to attack off that league group sooner or later, and it's Laurent Brochard in the town of Saint-Laurie-Soulon. He's trying to get away, get himself a little gap. Only the final climb to go. Chris, time to pick a winner. Well, I think it's going to be Pereiro, Bougar or Armstrong. They're really going to have to go for it from the bottom of the climb, but I think it's still doable. Covering all his, covering all his angles there. The league group has caught Brochard. Can Lance Armstrong and his group catch that group of six men ahead of them and can Lam Sang Strong take the stage win that he so much wants. Let's get back out on the road. Well, we're now approaching the final climb of the day. That's Michael Bogard at the front. On the right there is Oscar Pereiro, Oscar Sevilla at the back in the pink, Laurent Brochard, George Hincapi, and they are all now facing up to what will be a 10.8-kilometre climb. This climb is a giant of the tour. It's a climb up to Plata Day. It's an average gradient of about 8.3%, but it is such a scary climb when you bear in mind that already by the time they reach the floor of this climb, they've been in the saddle for 195 kilometers. Coming up here is the team manager for Discovery Channel, and there is the banner indicating 10 kilometers to go to the finish. It's gonna be a massive pursuit of the slopes of this climb. I really can't believe that Armstrong and the rest of the troops can wipe out seven and a half minutes. There it is, Paul. Ten kilometres to go. They're still clear. George Hincapi will be wondering what he should do shortly. He's going to have to take the responsibility for Team Discovery Channel. Oscar Pereira is the man who's been doing the majority of the pacemaking. We have to remember over the last couple of years, Hincapi has become somewhat of a climber, especially in the month of July, but he's never really been able to stay with a group until the final climb of the day. Here, I think with a seven and a half minute advantage, Phil, he's actually in a race winning situation. Well, they're going to have to fly up behind. I just, Stephen Lance Armstrong, Ulrich and Basso can't surely fly across a seven and a half minute gap in what is in effect seven and a half kilometers, a little bit more, of course. But they're now on the climb of the saint marie soulon climb to the Plade Day, a mountain which has seen great battles over the years, and indeed Lance Armstrong as a winner. Nine and three-quarter kilometres to the summit. Oscar Pereira, who at one stage was almost the leader of this Tour de France, with a lead of some 20 minutes and a deficit overall of 24. That's all gone now. We're looking at around about seven, and by the time Armstrong gets here, it could be inside six. Well, Pereira now has got to do the job of setting the pace at the front, and Hincapi, to me, Phil, still does not look like a broken man. He actually looks the freshest of all of these riders, and since they escaped after 27 kilometres, I can't believe that George has really had to do that much work to stay in contact. He's very much been in a defensive role here this afternoon, 
and that is probably going to go to his advantage because all of these men are extremely tired. It's really a question of survival. I can't see why they should be tired for. They've only crossed half of the mountains in the Pyrenees today. It has been an incredible day. How these guys do it after the way they rode it yesterday. Look at this. Oscar Sevilla, who has been off the back, has decided the best method is to attack and see what happens. And he's got himself a gap. Well, Sevilla is a great climber. We've seen him in the Vuelta a España in the past. Let's not forget this man was the white jersey, the best young rider in the Tour de France. The strategy here is to try and get himself a stage victory if he can. He's not been riding well over the previous climbs, but if he can cause the other riders to panic, this may well be good for him. But look at the way Oscar Pereiro is coming back. Pereiro has been the instigator of this move. He's done the majority of the work. And sorry, Oscar, you're not having a win quite that easily. Well, that's going to hurt Oscar now because Pereira has taken up the race here and has gone straight over the top of Oscar Sevilla. I'm not sure whether this was planned to be quite so early, but Oscar Pereira has got himself a little bit of a lead. Bogart won't like it. Here comes Bogart. George is right behind him, Hincapi. And they've hooked up with Pereira. Now there are three. Now there are just three riders. Michael Bogart making the effort to get across to Pereira. Bros are there paying for all of his attacks. He is going to slip back to sixth place on the road. In front of him, Sevilla. In front of him, Calcioli. Hincapi responded superbly there to ride across that gap. And if he can climb up this climb field, the best he's ever climbed in his life, he could be looking at a brilliant victory. Well, what an incredible day. Inspired perhaps by... The loss of the teammate, Fabio Casatelli, 10 years ago to this very day. Hincapi is now, it's on his shoulders to try and keep the victory in-house. Lance Armstrong, he'll keep his lead in the Tour de France, but he surely can't reach these three. Well, Hincapi didn't ride the Tour de France with Fabio Casatelli. Hincapi's first Tour de France was 1996, but he did ride as a teammate with him for two years. Hincapi turning professional back in 1994 for the then Motorola squad. Three talented boys, well known to us, Oscar Pereira, Michael Bogart, George Hincapi trying to move clear on the climb. The gap is seven and three quarter minutes to the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong. Bogart, has, his whole day has been built around winning here at the finish. At one stage, he had two riders on his team in the breakaway with him. They've fallen away now. 7.42 is the latest. Lance is still coming in the group. Well, if it comes down to a sprint, I know who my money's on, but I'm sure it won't come down to a sprint. As you can see, Pereira looking over his shoulder to just to try and ascertain what the gap is back to the chasers behind. But we're now down to just three riders from what was originally a 14-man group. And Hincapi getting out of the saddle there, but still looks reasonably comfortable. He still does, and he's tucked in nicely. Look at the crowd here this afternoon. They are, have come here in their hundreds of thousands to witness this stage of the Tour de France and they may well finally get the victory that they've been looking for because they expected the victory may well come to a Basque rider from Uscatel Uscadi but we've got a Spanish rider at the front of the race, Oscar Pereira followed by a Dutchman on the right there, Michael Bogard followed by an American in the blue and grey jersey of Discovery Channel, George Hincapi there's the American flag for Hincapi but I have to say, although there are a lot of American spectators here on the slopes of this climb, I would have to say the majority are Spanish. There's no doubt about that. The orange uh, Basque shirts tell us that. Yes, the Basque, of course, not Spanish in their eyes because they are the Basque people. They have their own language and they are here to cheer Basque riders. But there aren't any anywhere near this group now. Oscar Pereiro stamps on the pedals alongside Michael Bogart. George Hincapi just sits there. His job is to follow because Lance is his man. Hincapi is sitting down in the saddle, showing that he's still fairly well rested compared to the other two guys who have to get out of the saddle to use their handlebars and their arms to keep the gears ticking over. Hincapi could be looking here at a most magical victory for him because he is the freshest of that leading group. But at the end of the day, Phil, this is still an awful long way to go to the summit. This is a nasty climb. And this is Laurent Brochard coming up behind Oscar Sevilla. So he's fought his way up as far as Oscar as they continue on the climb. It's still a long way. That's Pietro Calcioli, in the white and green jersey. And we move right up to the three front runners here. Arms, uh, Hank Capri rather, looks good at the moment. He's the little group behind in half a minute now. The Mayo Jean of Lance Armstrong is at 7 minutes 40. There he is. He's swinging in through Saint-Marie-Soulon.
Seven minutes and 40 seconds. He's sitting at the back of this five-man group, uh, hand in the air. Looking down, I don't think, I think it, this is basically a water call here for Armstrong for the final climb of the day. Again, keeping himself topped up the energy levels and the liquid levels as much as possible. He is always worried about getting dehydrated on these very hot mountain stages. Back in the team car will be Johan Brunil. Now the next man to go back and look to take on board water will be Ivan Basso. Well, there's the campers. They've been down there for about a week waiting for the arrival of the Tour de France. There's a mass of people at the bottom waiting to see all the people on the slopes and to the top. Lance Armstrong's taken on board more fluid. This is the next group now getting bigger and bigger, containing Michael Rasmussen. But you know, Rasmussen at the moment is losing second place overall. Ivan Basso is in the ascendancy. Ivan Basso is looking at that second place position, a position he felt was rightly his last year. He was second up until 48 hours to go in the Tour de France when he was overtaken in the final time trial by the German rider Andreas Cloden. But even Jan Ulrich, if he rides well on the slopes of this climb, Phil could be looking at moving up into third. On the early slopes of the climb, this is the difficult part of the Plata Day. You've come along the valley floor through the town of saint Lary. And Armstrong now is going to the front with the three men with him. Those two guys at the back must be wondering what kind of a bus have we got tickets for here? Because that is Bertoliati, who was in the early breakaway. He's definitely not one of the great climbers. The next man up there in the blue is Jérôme Pino. But I'm sure once these big men start to turn up the pressure, they will disappear from the group. Further up, still with seven and a half minutes advantage at seven kilometers to go. It's Oscar Pereira in the green and yellow of Fonac. The blue and grey is George Hincapie. Michael Bogard has won two stages in the Tour de France before. One of them on the outskirts of the Alps in uh, Aix-les-Bains, the other in the very heart of the Alps at the summit of La Plagne. And today he's looking to add one in the Pyrenees if he can. But this is going to be a serious battle between three men who must by now be extremely tired, having led the race for since the 27th kilometre. They've been at the head of affairs here for 170 kilometres. Looking further back, this is one of the riders who was in the break just a little area earlier. That is Piotr Cocchioli, the rider from Credit Agricole. And if you look at this climb, the way these riders are going up it, you get an idea of how difficult it is. Now, this is Basso launching the attack. He's got a gap now over Jan Ulrich. Armstrong is just saying there with Ulrich. Ulrich now, it's the attack from Armstrong. He's going across the gap. Well, look at that, Basso slipped away up the front and Armstrong, with that incredible sprint he possesses when somebody hits him hard, has crossed the gap. He waited to see whether Jan Ulrich was going to respond and once he saw that Ulrich didn't have that response, Ulrich couldn't go up to the wheel of Basso. He said, right, I'm going to go myself and he has leapt across that gap again like a scalded cat. He's on the tail of Ivan Basso. These are the two champions of the Tour de France here this afternoon. Behind, everybody will have to ride in their own personal purgatory. Well, Ivan Basso took his chance well there. He gave it 100%. He's looking around to see how he's getting on. He looked the wrong way because the man he fears most is right underneath his armpit. And now Lance Armstrong has joined him. Basso would need a 2 minutes 47 ahead of Lance Armstrong to get the yellow jersey. Of course, he does get a little time bonus. It might make it a little bit less than that, but it doesn't matter because Armstrong is with him. But Basso just now is going to be confirmed at least in second place in the tour tonight. Jan Ulrich has been forced to come on alone as well. Bit of a story of the tour for, for poor old Jan. He's always alone. He's going to have to ride for himself here, just try and get into a rhythm because it's important for him. It's not really that much of a worry now, Phil, as to whether or not he's going to lose time on Armstrong and Basso. The important thing for him is to get time over Michael Rasmussen if he can because Ulrich, too, could be moving up in the overall classification. Look at Armstrong's face. I don't really see Ivan Basso getting rid of him and I must really think back to the Giro d'Italia. I must question the team's logic in taking him to the Giro d'Italia when he could be rivaling Armstrong here for the win. Well, here we go, picking up riders from the breakaway. That's Heimar Zubeldia in front of Jan Ulrich. As we now see here, riders collapsing one after another. But these two, now they're like they're in the Pyrenees. Side by side, they come up. In fact, there'll be Isasi now that they're picking up, I think, here. Or Kamano, perhaps. They were all up there originally. 
But look at that crowd on this climb of the Plata Day. Somewhere down there is the Tour de France. And it is Kamala. They've just, Ulrich has just passed. And Ulrich is going to get in amongst it. Now, these crowds have got to stay pretty orderly here. And we don't want the United States making a mess of it either by running in front of Jan Ulrich. Maybe he's just trying to clear the way. This is an unbelievable crowd. And what you have to bear in mind, because of the nature of this climb, all of these people have actually had to walk up the climb from the valley floor to be here. Ulrich, to me, seemed to be recovering. He seemed to be getting himself back into a rhythm. You can just see the motorbikes going around the corner. Those motorbikes are behind Armstrong and Basso. The Tour de France on the Plat de Day. There's no crowds been like this the whole tour. We thought they were big elsewhere. The lonely two figures of Basso and Armstrong. He taps out the rhythm, no doubt listening to that swinging chain, beating at his heart, following it with the rhythm of his legs. Basso's been brilliant in this Tour de France, and I thought he was making a real mess of things riding the Tour of Italy first. Well, maybe that will be the case, but next year he will come back, and I'm sure that with the absence of Lance Armstrong, he will dedicate himself not to the Tour of Italy, but to this event only, because he's shown that he can climb like Armstrong, and his time trialling ability has improved also. This is a little bit further down the slope. This is a move now by Floyd Landis to try and pull himself back into the race, and on his wheel was Michael Rasmussen. They've got nothing left. They are pending at the upper limits now, and this is a great situation here. Lord Floyd Land is trying to drag into the race now. The time gaps are 8 minutes 30 seconds, 7.15, 7.01 to the Mayo Jean. As the riders continue now, the Volker Dot jersey is under pressure as well. But it's the big three who are trying to forge a gap. Well, a big two, rather. The big two are trying to forge the gap. They're not doing very much to the leading group because the leading group is still well up the road because George Hincapie is still in contact. Three riders leading the race, being chased here by two serious challengers, Ivan Basso and Lance Armstrong. So Oscar Pereiro, Michael Bogart and George Hincapie are still locked together in their lonely battle, while further down the slopes there is a massive chase going on. And even Vinokurov is trying to get back in the action here now. He's somewhere on the mountain. I'm not sure where he is anymore now as he tries to cut his way from Ryman Sabre. He's trying to chase him down. We've just passed Jerome Pino. He's washed away. He was with the leading group. This is an incredible showdown now. Everybody is totally committed. Jan Ulrich is at seven minutes two off the lead now. Battle on battle. Well, hats off to Basso, but Armstrong is just sitting there. He can't take any risks. Well, we'll take a quick break there, but we'll be back to, for the finale of Stage 15. Lance Armstrong has left it late. This has been... This is Francisco Mancebo. He's faced a picture of pain here. He started the day in seventh overall. We are five kilometers from the summit now for this little group. And this is the group down there that contains Jaroslav Popovic. It has been a doer battle. And we have spread the Tour de France right through the Pyrenees. Inside five kilometers to go for the leaders. This is the leaders. Or oh, these are the leaders, rather. And still a lot of work being done by Oscar Pereiro. Oscar Pereira is probably the best climber from this leading group, but they're going to have to pay very much attention to the man who wears number 103 there because Pietro Calcioli is a very good rider when it comes to these big mountain top finishes. He's finished high in the overall standings of the Giro d'Italia. Hincaspi must be wondering what is happening. I'm inside of five kilometers to go and a mountain top finish. This could be one of the biggest surprises of the tour if Hincapi comes up with the win. Well, behind, Hincapi's captain is coming, but he's not coming quick enough, I don't think. Six, sec uh, six minutes and six seconds to George, to uh, Lance Armstrong group. Here they are. And this has been a superb battle. Alan Davis is getting mixed up in this now as he comes back from the original breakaway. Boy, he's never been in this sort of company, three kilome five kilometres from the summit, Paul. He certainly hasn't. He will look across and he'll be able to throw that into his bag of memories too. Ulrich now, I think, starting to lose a little bit of time for because there is no car around that corner anymore. There is no sight of the two men who are locked together in their own personal battle. Now, this again is another move. This is Calcioli who's gone off the front. And this is the man who was dropped on the lower part of the climb and he came back and now he's going for it. This could be a huge boost for the 
Freddy Agricole team. He was brought in to be the man of the mountains for the overall. He's let them down in that respect. But what would they think of a win here? Well, here's the answer. Oscar Pereiro answers. Oscar Pereiro's come back. This has put George Hincapie into a spot of bother, but look how Hincapie responds. No he wants problem. the win here this afternoon. He has the freshest legs in what was originally a 14-man group, and Hincapie is right on the tail. If any of these guys want to win the stage this afternoon, they've got to get rid of Big George because there's nobody, not nobody, is going to beat him in the sprint. Well, don't be surprised if George tries one of his own here because he's so strong, he's taken a leaf out of Lance Armstrong's book and just sprinted across the gap. Pereira might say to George, look, we've got to go. We've got the other two, let's leave it to fight between ourselves. Pereira takes it up, George Hincapie follows. The other two have trapped Bogart as well. Well, that was a great response by Hincapie. Pereira now, Phil, actually doesn't really know what to do. He knows the power of George Hincapie. You know, Hincapie's had a good season as they go inside of four kilometres to go. Hincapie's had three wins this year. Two of those came in the Dauphiné Libre just three weeks before the start of the Tour de France. It's going to be a tough job for the man on the right-hand side there to beat the man in blue and grey. For ten years, George Hincapie has been running in the Tour de France. He has never won a stage. He's always unselfishly been at the side of Armstrong. That's why he's here. That's his raison d'etre. And now he's got the chance of a lifetime to win one for himself. Both looking back, they're both nervous, as you can see the banner there indicating the four kilometres to go point. And Hincapie is wondering, can I stay with this man? Because this man, in theory, on paper, is a superior climber to me, but that's not at the end of a long stage like this. Well, as we go back to Ivan Basso and Lance Armstrong, they're alone again. And this is another man who's been alone since the climb started, Jan Ulrich. But that car is just in front, and the other two are just ahead of the car. He's certainly not losing ground, but I don't think we can say he's catching up either. I think he's locked right now in his own personal battle. There's a huge crowd here on the slopes of Padadei, and they knew something special was going to happen. But Michael Rasmussen now is starting to find his rhythm. He wants to keep second place overall. I think that might be just a little bit too far away from him, but he's still battling, Phil, to keep himself on the podium. Well, Armstrong at 5.42 now behind the two front runners. And I think uh, Rasmussen is about a minute behind Ulrich, and he's trying to get rid of Vinokurov here, as he's desperate now to defend that polka dot jersey. He needs, he's okay at the moment, he's holding third position in the race. I think it's fair to say he'll lose second. I think he will lose second unless he does something very magical before the end of this race here this afternoon, but he's in a strange position. Came to the Tour to win a stage and win the polka dot jersey. He never thought he was going to be battling for a podium position. And it looks as if there's a spectator there. One of the Bass spectators got in front of the television. And uh, if you do get in front of a motorbike when the motorbike's going uphill, it can be rather dangerous. Well, that is very unfortunate for everybody concerned, but our pictures are here now with the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong and Basso. While down... But, oh, and there's been a crash. Oh, that's the pictures again. Well, Armstrong and Basso are locked together in a major battle, while further up the road we have got an unbelievable battle going on. It's so dangerous for the two leaders. You know, just a few moments ago there was a nasty accident when the motorbike camera behind the two leaders, Pereira and Hincapi, in fact rode over the top of a spectator. But I have to say, Hincapi is looking very calm and collected, and he will get more excitement, Phil, as they get closer to the summit of this climb. Every kilometre that goes by, I think Hincapi is going to feel just that little bit more solid and in the, he'll start to get himself into the skin of a winner. Well, George knows now that Lance is not going to join him on this climb. We're two miles from the top, five minutes, 20 is the gap. The battle for the final yellow jersey in Paris is right here between Basso and Lance Armstrong. The battle for first place today is between Pereiro and George Hincapi. Well, they've just gone under the banner, indicating three kilometres to go to the summit. Now, this is really quite a remarkable performance by Hincapi. He has always, in the last six years, helped Lance Armstrong in the mountains. Today, he was given a free ticket. Go in the breakaway. That might be our best method of defence, because at least you'll still be there at the end if we catch up. But right now, they are not going to catch up. The winner of the stage must certainly come from one of these two riders. Pereiro is all over his machine. I don't think he can win the stage if he doesn't get rid of George Hincapie, because Hincapie 
at the end of the day is a sprinter. Well, mixed feelings here because Pereira has been something of a man of this Tour de France and deserves the victory probably more than George Hincapi does. Further down the slope, though, Basso still working with Armstrong. Neither of these boys have cracked. They are not shirking their duty. They are getting on with it. Not far off our camera is Ulrich. Ulrich is actually only 22 seconds behind Armstrong and Basso. And going, look he's, at this. These, this part of the climb is actually starting to suit him. This is a very strange climb. It's a horrible climb because there are moments when it's steep, there are moments when it's flat. It actually suits the pure climbers because they are the guys who can change their rhythm. But for Ulrich, who's the powerful climber, he can use his big gears on the flatter part of the course. The crowd is ballistic here. They are cheering on everybody. They are probably hoping that Oscar Pereira is going to take the win. But if Hincapi takes the win, they shouldn't worry too much because he can speak Spanish too. Well, the gap back to Armstrong now is 5 minutes 22. He won't see them till the finish. These are the two riders making the waves up here. Look at this as they crash through the people from Spain. Number four, George Hincapi, 68, is Oscar Pereiro. Both deserve the victory, and they're going to take it to the line because nobody's going to catch them. And I don't think anybody's going to drop George Hincapi because he's getting the bit between his teeth. He can feel more confident. He is looking up there at the banners. He knows the finish line is getting so much closer. The two riders who are chasing a little further back are actually around about 30 seconds in arrears. We've just had the running of the balls in Pamplona. Well, this is the running of the Basques on the slope here of Luza of Plata de. Well, a Spanish rider had to be in the frame somewhere, and he's not a Basque rider, but he's certainly Spanish, and that's a Spanish flag. And Oscar Pereira is riding on a tidal wave of noise here. Lance just checks over his shoulder to see if anybody is coming back. He couldn't possibly see in this crowd. You can't see further back more than about 100 metres because this is a wave of people just opening up to allow the riders to come through and then closing in behind them. As soon as they get that little bit closer to the finish, they will get inside the barriers and finally they will feel safe. But Hincapi now, Phil, must be thinking, what am I going to do? He probably never even looked at the race book to see what the finishing line looks at because he didn't think he was going to be here. Correct. Inside two kilometres for the leaders, five minutes, 21, the gap to Lance Armstrong and Ivan Basso. And now they are just slowing down for the first time. And Jan Ulrich continues to fight here. This is uh, Oscar Sevilla he's now picking up, who was originally with that breakaway. He slowed down. Can he help Ulrich? Well, he'll try and do what he can. He's probably given the information by his team manager. Wait for Jan, try and pace him, see if you can lift him up. Because it's not really important for Ulrich in this situation to catch the two riders in front. What's important is for him to put time between himself and Michael Rasmussen. Yep. After all, let's not forget Ulrich's worst performance in the Tour de France since 1996, his fourth. He doesn't want to be fourth again. He would like to get onto the podium this year with Lance Armstrong. Well, look at that face now. He's very pain. He's shouting at Oscar Sevilla, I think, to just lift it a little bit. This is further up the road. Look at the determination here now of Lance Armstrong and the grimace of pain on Ivan Basso. I don't think he's going to get rid of Basso too easily. He looks a bit sharp there. He looks very sharp, but he is suffering. But everyone has to suffer on the slopes of the Plata Day. Ulrich, you can see the size of the gear that he's using. And in fact, I don't think Oscar Sevilla can go fast enough for Ulrich, who says, OK, just lift it again. Keep me in this race. Get me up to the podium. This is a moment of panic as we go just a fraction further up the road. And this race now is being looked on by hundreds of thousands of Spanish spectators. And you can be absolutely certain everybody there with an orange T-shirt or an orange hat on wants the man in first place to win, Oscar Pereiro. Just look at these people, just enough room for these two riders to get through. They pull back at the last minute. They must be deaf here with the decibels of the shouting here from the Spanish flags. Oscar Pereira has done all of the pacemaking, Hincapi all of the following. Uh, but it won't be that way when he sees the town and the finishing line. We are now approaching the top of the Plata Day. We are looking for one kilometre to go of this remarkable day in the saddle. Hincapi losing it a bit there, one kilometre to go to the summit, that's about one kilometre to go to the finish, and there is the Flam Rouge. They have finally Phil reached safety, the safe haven of the barriers. They've got a 1,000 metres to go. Hincapi looks over his shoulder, what's the situation? Is Calcioli coming back? Well, George, he's not coming back. The winner is going to be either of these two riders we're looking at. Green and yellow is Pereiro for Spain. 
blue and grey is Hincapi for the United States. Herrero has been obliged to lead all the way. He's been carried up here by the shouts of his countrymen who have come over the mountains from Spain to look for a Spaniard to win. Now the pressure is on. George, of course, speaks fluent Spanish, but that's as close as he'll get. He is from the United States. He is an American, and he can't believe he's in a position to win now. Lance won't be coming up. He's five minutes, 25 seconds behind at the moment. Incapi Phil is looking right now at winning one of the legendary stages of the Tour de France. We've been over six mountain passes here this afternoon. He is in an ideal position to take the victory. He's got the explosive sprint, but when you've been away for so long, there is all is a doubt. In theory, there is no man in the here, here around who should be able to beat Hincapi. Well, I don't think, Paul, since 1999, any of Lance Armstrong's teammates have ever won a stage in the Tour de France. And this is about to change, I think. Surely he's got enough left now because he's had the passengers ride ever since they broke away after 27 kilometers. There were 14. There are now two, and still Hincapi is behind. He looks powerful, he looks relaxed, and now he knows they're getting slowly but surely to the finish. He's in the ideal position, he has to make sure he's in the right gear. Pereira gets out of the saddle, he is pacing Hincapi, but Hincapi is looking now like a man who is tense. He's looking like a man who is ready to pounce as they come up. They haven't seen the finish line yet, but Hincapi has got the explosion. I just hope he doesn't make a mistake. The pressure, the pressure now as Hincapi is waiting to see where it is. Oscar Pereira responding to the crowd, he surely will have no answer. Having led all of this way, Hincapi is going to make this a formality. Pereira takes him wide, it's still a long way to go. It is long and interminable, the 1,000 metres at the top of a mountain like this. There are 300 metres to go, Oscar Pereira opens up the gap, but Hincapi's ready. Hincapi goes at 200, and now there'll be no answer for Pereiro. This is going to be yet another memorable moment in the life of this American team. Lance Armstrong, when he can't win, why not send up George Hincapi to finish off a perfect day of tactical copybook reading? And George Hincapi, after 10 years in the Tour de France, finally gets a victory, and he cannot believe it. George Hincapi, Tour de France stage winner, Platte Day, 2005. After 10 years of trying, Oscar Pereiro crosses the line. 10 years of trying for George Hincapi, and he gets himself his first ever stage win. Phil, since 1999, all he's ever done is ride as a dedicated teammate to Lance Armstrong. Today, he's opened up the copybook for himself. Well, there's the congratulations. But this is the man finishing in third place now is Pietro Cauchioli. As he comes home as well, the clock is starting. 32 seconds has passed by. As you can imagine, the congratulations behind the scene. Cauchioli crosses the line. 38 seconds he lost in the close. And then Michael Bogart, who I think was really set up for the win as far as he was concerned, didn't quite come for him in the end. He couldn't answer the attack of Pereiro, and he was left. But still, fourth place to Michael Bogart. That's a great ride by Michael Bogart, but what a hard way for all of these riders to get themselves to the summit of Plata Day. And here comes Laurent Brochard. Brochard did a great ride too. He attacked a number of times from the summit of the Col de Perisord but he couldn't break the stranglehold of the group he was with, and this is also a very hard day in the saddle for the former French world champion. Michael Brushard, uh, Laurent Brushard, I beg your pardon, comes up, the former world road race champion. He delivers a fifth-place finish, yet that's a very good ride for the Frenchman, as he is now the first Frenchman up the mountain today. And it won't be long now, we see a minute 36 and counting on the clock, about another three minutes perhaps before the arrival of Lance Armstrong. Well, further down the mountain, we haven't seen for a while Ivan Basso and Lance Armstrong, but they are currently still locked in battle together. It's a long ride up to this finishing straight. I would say today, when you see the Flamme Rouge that indicates a thousand meters to go, it probably feels around about two minutes. So a minute of 59, two minutes is now passed. Uh, Dan Sarsong still, of course, on the lower slopes and pacemaking Ivan Basso because that's his turn. They're going to keep on coming. It's a question of which one will take the sprint. It's not so important to Armstrong, you know, as the clock keeps going on. Brochard crosses the line. It's still a little wait, but the impetus out of the chases now. 
As we see now, it's Basso's turn at the front. Armstrong follows. He's in the same position now as George Hincapie was a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, but for Armstrong, I think what was important for him today was to keep a very close eye on Ivan Basso. He regards him as the man who will probably take over the mantle as favourite for the Tour de France next year, while further down the slopes, this man is in his own private battle, but here, joined by Oscar Sevilla, his teammate, he is trying to ride himself into a podium position. The crowd here is monumental. This is one of the largest crowds. I think it has to be the yeah. biggest crowd we've had at the Tour de France this year. Well, they came here to see a Spanish winner. They've at least seen a Spanish week, a speaker win it in George Hincapi, but Pere Pereiro had to take second place. Now it's the battle for the podiums in Paris. And Ivan Basso has had a day to remember today. He wasn't afraid of Armstrong, he just couldn't get rid of him. He attacked him enough times. Armstrong comes up behind Ivan Basso. We are looking at first and second tonight in the Tour de France. I'm pretty sure about that. I'm pretty certain about that, but there's still a long way to go up to Paris, and Ivan Basso would like to get himself a little bit more time over Michael Rasmussen and Jan Ulrich if he can, because there's still a very difficult time trial to come around the city of Saint-Étienne. Look at these faces. These are faces of riders who've been in the saddle for almost 200 kilometers of racing here this afternoon, and now it is almost over. It's a question of pride, I think, for Ivan Basso to ride alongside Lance Armstrong, but I still question why the team sent him to the Giro d'Italia. He grits his teeth now, he kicks again, he knows he's carrying up towards the finishing line, the man he fears most in the world of cycling, Armstrong. Over four minutes has now gone by, and uh, they're in sight at 350 metres, and Armstrong has got himself in just the position to sprint by to take the next place. He's sprinting for sixth place. I don't think he's going to sprint here. He's quite happy to be in the company of Ivan Basso. There are no more time bonuses at stake. So sixth or seventh or eighth position is not really all that important for Armstrong. I think he'll just be happy to stay and cross the line in the same time as Ivan Basso. All he's got to do then is stay exactly where he is and let Basso have his moment. He will cross the line in sixth. As they drive on towards the finish, Armstrong just eases out of the sun. You're right, he is not going to challenge Ivan Basso. These two have raced one-on-one -on -one all the way up the mountain. They have thrown their best punches at one another. Now they're going to cross the line together to live to fight another day. And what a day this was between these two riders. Ivan Basso deserves that place. Five minutes and four seconds down. Armstrong locked in there, but you know Jan Ulrich now is in the safety of the barriers. He's coming up to the final finish, and he too is looking to see what the time gap fill is going to be between himself and Michael Rasmussen. But Armstrong consolidates his position at the top of the overall classification today, as Jan Ulrich has got his own personal battle a little bit further down the slopes to see whether or not he can see him pull himself up into the podium. While Lance Armstrong will be ushered in to get yet another yellow jersey, this is the arrival of Jan Ulrich up towards the finish. Looking for an eighth place if he comes round. Uh, Sevilla, 5.45. And what a happy day this is for the team Discovery. And coming up behind Jan Ulrich in the distance, there he is, is Michael Rasmussen. If you deserve to keep your lead, then you do now, because he will conserve third place tonight in the Tour de France. That is a show of defiance, if there has been one. Well, that's a show of defiance, Phil, by a man who said he came to the Tour de France with two objectives. The two objectives were to win a stage, he did that, and to win the King of the Mountains classification. He's well on his way to doing that. But by catching up with Jan Ulrich in the final 500 metres of this stage, he is actually going to keep himself right up there in third place overall at the end of the day. What a ride, and here comes Rasmussen as well. Well, what a day that turned out to be. We expected it was going to be a major battle. We expected a big sort out at the top end of the overall classification as we look here at Alexander Vinokurov coming up. And Vinokurov, I think, will find that at the end of today, he too has moved a lot higher up in the overall standings because he could very well see himself climbing up into fifth or sixth place once the clock stops for everybody. But we're going to have to wait an awful long time now to see whether or not Floyd Landis and Levi Leipheim with the two Americans in fifth and sixth place overall are going to lose themselves big chunks of time. This is a beast of a climb here up to the summit of Plata Day, but we have seen a great battle. We've seen a great winner 
with George Hincapi getting, strangely enough, only the 14th victory of his career. But of course, this has got to be one of the greatest ones. He has won himself an individual stage at the Tour de France for the first time since he began participating in 1996. As Alexander Vinokurov stops the clock for him in 7 minutes and 31 seconds. But behind what is important is to see just how far back the rest of the challenges are and the man who is the best of the rest is going to be Levi Leipheimer. So Leipheimer too should keep hold of his fifth place in the overall classification this evening. Great bribe by Leipheimer who I reckon is riding the best Tour de France of his career. Is Christophe Moreau. He too is trying to keep himself in the top ten. He wants to remain as the best Frenchman in this event. He's dug deep, he was dropped early on on the Col de Peresort, fought his way back, was dropped again on the Col de saint Larry, and then, finally, he found his rhythm on the slopes of the Plata Day. 8.15. Now it's Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans in company of Aymar Zubeldia. Zubeldia was hoping to carry the hopes of the Basque nation on his shoulders here this afternoon. He hasn't been able to do that, but at least he's managed to get himself to the top ten on this stage, as Cadell Evans, I think, has ridden a superb race here this afternoon. He's learning an awful lot about himself. He started the day in 12th place, and he may well pull himself up into the top ten, because we're going to have to wait a long time for Andreas Cloden to come to the finish. Looking back, the next man to cross the line is Eddie Mazzolini of Team Lampre. Look at these time gaps, though. And Floyd Landis looks to me as if he's cracked just a fraction over the last few metres. In company of Yaroslav Popovic, wearing the white jersey, he will consolidate his advantage in the white jersey as the best young rider in the Tour de France this year. And there's no mercy either as he jumps away from Landis. Lloyd Landis looks as if he hit the wall a fraction over the last few metres as he comes up to the line. Yaroslav Popovic is just riding up to the finish line. Popovic is in 13th place overall, and he's got himself a few seconds back on the man who started the day in sixth place. Nine and a half minutes for Floyd Landis. Well, there's a long time to wait until the final riders come up here. That is where we are, crowned on the top of this plateau just in the heart of the Pyrenees. Plata Day is where we are. Saint-Larry is right down in the bottom there. And it only takes about 10 minutes in the cable car, but these riders took around about 40 minutes to come up here. Well, I think uh, there's no doubt we're on top of a mountain when you look at a picture like that. The Saint-Larry Soulon is way below. This is the Plata Day at night. You can see the lights up here from the valley below. George Hincapie has been coming to the Tour de France since 1996 when he didn't finish. And the day he abandoned Paul, stage 15 in his very first Tour de France. Ten years on, well, ten tours on, he's winning on that same day. Quite remarkable when you think of that. But just look at the happy face here on Georgie. I wonder when he went in that breakaway, Phil, after 28, 27 kilometres of the stage covered, if he really believed that he was going to survive and stay off the front. He is a man who is renowned for his performances on the flatlands. He's great in races like the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix, but this will be probably one of the biggest memories of his sporting career. Well, there's no doubt about that, because when you're racing for a man of the ability of Lance Armstrong, you get very little, almost never any chance of riding for yourself. That's the way it is. You share in the success of your team leader. Today he went up the road because he said he felt good, and he says, if we get 10 minutes, I can wait for Lance. When they got 20, then he was told he had to start looking out for himself. He had to think about a different situation, and he was in an ideal situation that I think every professional rider dreams of, being in a breakaway and given the order by the team manager to sit on and not work because you are the teammate of the race leader. Well, the riders continue to finish here, and this is going to be a big-time deficit for an awful lot of riders. That was Andreas Cloden coming in. There's the scene behind, and that is George Hincapi being congratulated by Lance Armstrong. First time he's done that. No teammate has ever won uh, riding for Lance's victories in the last seven years of the Tour de France until now. Well, the reason for that is, Phil, up until this moment, they've always had to dedicate themselves and sacrifice themselves for Lance Armstrong. I don't know if we can just listen to George here. 
see what he has to say. George, talk about the strategy to put you in the early breakaway. You guys were away for almost the whole day. That had to be tough coming up all the mountains. Yeah, I knew it was going to be a tough day, and I actually just wanted to go in the break so I can have a head start on the group and possibly wait for Lance and help him out at the finish. But we ended up getting 18 minutes, and uh, Johan and Dirk said, you, know, you guys aren't coming back. George, do your race, and they gave me the go-ahead, and it's a dream come true today. You had such great success in the in the early spring, of course, winning the one of the early classics. Perry Roubaix very close. The Dauphiné win, being in the yellow for two stages. Talk about though how you transitioned your form to get ready for July and to help Lance. Just doing a lot of climbs. Um, <laughs> I still can't believe. It. It's all right to get emotional, partner. You know, I just. It's just doing every all the climb, a lot of work, work in the mountains, and and it's just hitting me right now. I just can't believe. You, uh, as I said earlier, you have had such great success. This has to though be the biggest win of your career. You're obviously getting a little misty-eyed, but talk about what's going through your mind right now. You know, I've, I've, I've worked hard, and I've been with Lance the last six years, and it's just been an, an amazing run. And everybody always asks me, why do you keep, why do you stay with Discovery Channel? Why do you stay with the same team? And this is the best team in the world. And, you know, if we have the CEO of Discovery here, Billy Campbell, and this is just uh, amazing that I won today. And I just, I'm happy. I know the team is really happy. And I know the team had a great day today with Lance, you know, getting more time on the rivals. And, just a fabulous day. You highlighted the strength of this team. However, let's look at how you guys have done in the first two weeks of the tour. Is this exactly where you want to be? Certainly winning this stage is a great accomplishment. Yeah, I'm definitely. I know that uh, I think Lance finished with Basel today, and when we wanted to get time on everybody, and Basel's riding super strong, but I think Lance will be able to take more time on him in the time trial, I hope. And, you know, this last week is very, very hard, so there's, there's no time to celebrate. we got a lot of hard work ahead of us, and I'm just going to be happy with the win today, and uh, I'm going to uh, take a well-deserved rest day tomorrow. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Well, what about that? It was supposed to be the boss's day, and it ended up being nicked by one of the domestic staff. Chris Baldman, George Hincap. I mean, tell us about how the tactics work. He was in there just to sit on the brake, and then suddenly the gap gets big and everything changes. Yeah, well, George covers the brake, and that means the Discovery team isn't really obliged to chase. Why would they chase down their own man? And, of course, once he gets that kind of time gap, it, it, he's in it for himself. It was a fantastic ride. And there, as we can see, he took uh, Oscar Pereiro pretty easily at the finish. Oscar Pereiro worked all the way through, didn't he? I was a little bit surprised at that. I mean, been 24th on, on GC, uh, I was quite surprised that he didn't get George to do any of the work, but obviously it worked for George. And here is how today's result has affected the overall standings. The big move, I suppose, is Ivan Basso leapfrogging Michael Rasmussen for second place. Yeah, I mean, obviously he did what, everything he had to do today. He committed himself in the final climb, and it's going to make possibly an interesting time trial, really. Really. Well, talking about the time trial, do you think Ulrich can make up, what is it, nearly three minutes on Rasmussen and get himself on the podium? I think that's a lot to ask, really. I think it pretty much he's settling himself into that fourth spot again. But it might be interesting between Rasmussen and Basso. All right. And finally, just a word about Lance today. He targeted this stage. Was it just tactically that the break got too big, or, or did he not have the strength? Yeah, he had to prioritise. I mean, everybody suffered today. Every single person really grovelled through the whole day. He did what he had to do for the overall, and they got the stage anyway. All right. Now then, before we go, we've got another winner in our tour competition. Neil Gage of Wolverhampton knew last week's answer which was that Lance Armstrong's first Tour de France was in 1993. He wins the trip to Paris to be there on the Champs-Élysées for the final stage of the Tour a week today. By the way, we'll be launching our third and final competition in tomorrow's rest day programme. Now, tomorrow is the second rest day of the Tour. We'll be re recapping all the action we've had over the last week through the Alps and the Pyrenees. We're on at our usual time of 7 o'clock here on ITV2 and 11.30 on ITV1. And don't forget, we are also back on tonight at 7 o'clock to wrap up all the presentations, all the implications, all the aftermath of today's stage. It's back to the usual routine on Tuesday for stage 16, and they're not out of the Pyrenees yet, the riders, although they will be by the time they hit Poe. They've got a couple of nasty climbs on the way, including the Col de Bisque, so it should be another fantastic day's racing. Well, he's still without a, uh, an individual stage win, Lance Armstrong. They took the team time trial, of course, Discovery. And his next chance might come next Saturday in the penultimate stage of the race. It's the individual time trial in San Etienne. He'll be targeting that one. Of course, he targeted the stage today. He wanted to win for Fabio Casartelli. He wanted to win for himself. In the end, he did neither. But in the process, 
he may have won his seventh overall Tour de France victory. See you tomorrow. Good night. Some new feelings that make you uncomfortable. So bring out all the good in me. Yeah. I say what I'll never be. Cause I got me some reason to look on my keys in the car that we're taking home. So won't you say what you said to me? On the roof of your house. Cause I've been having my doubts. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't know what we could be. Sometimes I feel we're nothing. But you don't Yes, now we're giving it a try. I like the way you describe it to people who won't go quiet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good evening from Mond, where the bad news for any locals hoping to fly out of their aerodrome today is that all flights have been cancelled. At least I hope they have, because stage 18 finishes on the runway. Now, this is only the tour's second visit to Mond, and if it's anything like the first one 10 years ago, we're in for a fantastic stage. Before we get on with it, though, let's remind ourselves of the overall standings with just four days left to go in the 2005 tour. And Lance Armstrong remains firmly in control at the top with two and three quarter minutes over Ivan Basso, a little over three minutes on Michael Rasmussen, with Jan Ulrich, Francisco Manthebo, and Levi Leipheimer rounding out the top six. The most aggressive rider in the race was the only man to move up yesterday, Alexander Vinokurov, now ahead of Floyd Landis and Cadell Evans in seventh. Now, Vino's in a lot of this morning's papers here in France because the speculation has already started as to which team he's going to sign for. According to the French sports daily L'Equipe, the favourites are either Ajay Dezer, Liberty Seguros or Credit Agricole. And above that story, they've got an even bigger one featuring Christophe Moreau. He's the current leader of Credit Agricole. He says that he's very upset that Roger Leger, the team boss, has said nothing to him about the negotiations that are apparently taking place and that if Vinokourov arrives in the off-season, then he'll be signing for somebody else. Now, one thing every rider, in fact, every journalist on the tour is aware of is that Lance Armstrong either reads every paper in the world or has them read for him. In fact, every time the name Lance Armstrong appears, even in a wire story, it's on his Blackberry a few minutes later. Joseba Balocchi is the man giving his memories of Lance today, and inevitably the one he comes up with is that terrible crash on the descent into Gap in 2003 when Balocchi went over and broke his hip and Armstrong went careering across that ploughed field, cut the corner, continued with the race, which he, of course, eventually won. He actually says that Lance Armstrong was the first man to phone him when he got to hospital, so presumably he's uh, still on Lance's Christmas card list. Right, that's Le Keep. Um, over in Aujourd'hui, there's the perennial French story. Les coeurs en français, ils essaient, mais non pas les jambes. The French riders try, but they just haven't got the legs. And Aujourd'hui has been running a daily cycling lexicography piece. Um, today, the phrase in question is faire l'accordion, which is uh, when the peloton expands and contracts as riders get shelled off the back on hilly stages and uh, then get back on. Might seem a strange choice now that we're out of the Pyrenees, but in fact, today's stage has got a couple of nasty little climbs on it. Now, like quite a few ex-riders, Laurent Jalabert has got a column. He actually writes for Le Keep, but today he was too modest to mention his great success the last time the tour came here. Midi Lieb covers it, though. They call it uh, La Grande Vadouille de Jalabert, the great day out, the great jaunt of Jalabert. Uh, it talks about his win here in 1995 on Bastille Day. Unforgettably, says, arriving in this huge black ribbon of tarmac, uh, as though he was arriving onto a movie set. And he says that uh, out of all his victories, and he's won in uh, the Tour of Spain, Milan San Remo, this, he reckons, is his greatest. In fact, uh, today's final climb, the Côte de Croix Neuve, has actually been renamed in his honour, the Monte Laurent Jalabert, and Chris Boardman's on it now. At first glance at the profile in the race manual, this looks like a fairly innocuous stage. After all, all the mountains are finished now, haven't they? Wrong. This climb out of Mond is effectively an Oars category mountain crammed into just three kilometres. In fact, at 10.1% average grade, it's the steepest climb in the whole Tour de France. And it comes at a time when all of the peloton is deeply fatigued. Ironically, one person who isn't going to be worried about losing mountain points today is Michael Rasmussen, who has effectively already won the King of the Mountains competition. One thing he does have to look out for is Jan Ulrich, who will be desperately trying to take seconds and put himself in a podium hopping position before the time trial on Saturday. A couple of other certainties that we're going to see today. One, there'll be a breakaway. And two, 
Vanukar off. For sure, he's going to use this to launch some more attacks. Now, there's the current state of play in the King of the Mountains competition. Michael Rasmussen has a 50-point lead over Oscar Pereira with Lance Armstrong third. There are only 56 mountain points left in the race, so he looks pretty well assured of that title. And there's today's stage profile. Fairly lumpy along the way, but all of the other climbs eclipsed by the final one up to the finish here in Mond. There they are, first and third in the mountains competition and the other way round in the general classification. Now, today's route saw the race pass underneath Sir Norman Foster's magnificent Milo Viaduct, giving all of us covering the race the chance to trot out our pet fact about it being taller than the Eiffel Tower. Today's first breakaway had ten men in it, including Axel Merckx, Carl Aster Cruz, who's been in more breaks than any other rider, Thomas Verkler trying to cheer the French up, and Matthias Kessler hoping to strike back for T-Mobile by taking back the lead in the team competition from Discovery. As we pick it up 60 kilometres or so from Mond, they've built themselves a healthy lead over the peloton. There's the big field uh, at the 60 kilometres point to, to where they'll finish in Mond at the aerodrome. And uh, the gap nearly at 30 minutes now. They're beginning to look as though they may have read it right. Well, the French getting pretty much slammed in the newspapers this morning. There were 17 riders in the breakaway yesterday. Five of them were Frenchmen and they couldn't make it across the split. In fact, it looks like Oscar Sevilla trying to get himself back onto the tail of the main field and slipping backwards uh, a little bit here. This is really, at this point, just to take on board drinks. That's Inika Ezasi from Uscatel Uscadi. Just finishing that thought about the French, they've got three French riders in the leading group of ten. They've only won one stage so far in their home tour, and that's why I think the press is coming down pretty hard on them. Yeah, uh, it's not always for a lack of time, but they certainly have been able to finish off what they've started. Sebastian Eno was in tears yesterday. He really was, uh, as uh, he finished fourth of four in the breakaway at the end. Here's the boys, though, are carrying the big prize list, and this is Discovery Channel. Benjamin Noval, who's carrying a power monitor, we call it an SRM, on his bike today. His average watts running at 391, average output at only 17 kilometres an hour. That's a very good reading, actually. Well, actually, to put that into perspective, he's just getting up to what is probably the hard part of his workout here. When he's work working very hard, it probably averages out between 400 to 450 watts. So you can tell that right now he is really starting to pull hard for the rest of the team on the slopes of this hill. His maximum when he really starts pushing on a climb like this can go up to around about 700. And to put that into perspective, Lance Armstrong can peak at 1,100 watts. I think I used to do about 275. 1.4 kilometers to the summit now for the leaders. Uh, while the main pack behind, they're just starting to climb. Boyon, or Boyne, that's where they are right now. So the main field on the same slope of this climb, but they don't really seem to be going quite as fast as the leading group of ten riders. Three French riders, by the way, in that leading group are Carlos de Cruz, who's been very aggressive since the start of this race. He rides for Francis de Jeux. The other Frenchman in the group is of course Thomas Vaucler who we've seen quite a lot of and then of course Cedric Vasseur the Frenchman who's the only man in the leading group of ten who's actually won a stage in the Tour de France and alongside Thomas Vaucler he's also worn the yellow jersey this at the back on the left hand side is the green jersey of Tor Hushoft. he's got a big advantage in the king of the sprint classification 14 points advantage over Stuart O'Grady just on the far side there number 121 and a 22 point advantage over Robbie McHugh and that's going to be a very difficult battle because days are actually running out for anybody to overtake the great Norwegian. Well Hushoft is going to be very happy with the way this is going right now because uh, nobody's scoring points and if nobody scores points then he's the winner in Paris and he'll be the first Norwegian ever to do that. He's led in the competition on two different races. There's Levi Leipheimer just peeping under the armpits there of Lance. He's lost a place already today uh, to Vinokurov, who got a four-second time bonus he's out on the course. Yeah, he's lost a place, but he's also got a bandage there on his right elbow, so he must have gone down in one of those accidents which the French like to re record on the race radio as shoot sans gravité. But it's always, uh, I always think it's rather a grave accident if you've got to get yourself bandaged up at the end of the day. And race back to the field, 58 kilometres now from the aerodrome. Nobody in this peloton are going to see that breakaway now. They're racing for what is 11th place, uh, which again might favour Stuart O'Grady. He was just outside the points yesterday. Uh, Robbie won't get up the hill, I don't think. McEwen, and I don't think Hushoff will. 
I'm not sure that too many of the guys in the main field will get up this field hill towards the end because I think the guys who are looking to make and cement their places in the top ten are going to have a serious sort out. Tough roads though, if you look at the surface there, this is the summit of the climb and it's Carlos de Cruz getting himself first place over the top, getting himself maximum points on this second category climb. But I think the important thing really is uh, not to attack at this point, to stay together as a solid group, a united group, in the hope that you can conserve as much of the advantage over the main field as possible, and then think about the sort out down towards the end. I have to think the strongest riders in this leading group have got to be Axel Merckx and, of course, Pelizzotti. Hi, I'm Thomas Fokler, and you can see... It's still looking good for the 10-man breakaway on the road to Monde. Before we get back to it, though, Ned and Chris have got a couple of your emails. OK, before we get back to the race, just time to answer a couple of your emails with Chris Boardman. I'll tell you what, this one had Chris working. It's a good question. It comes from Carol, who's written in asking, if Lance Armstrong wins the Tour this year and then retires, who gets to wear the number one race number next year? Go on then, Chris, what did you find out? Well, it is a bit of a tricky question. We asked the race organisation and they're still scrabbling around. It has been suggested that the next rider in Lance's team would take the number one spot, but we believe it is going to be the next rider on general classification who takes that number. So as that stands, that would be Ivan Besser? As it stands at the moment. Logical enough. Good question here also from Derek Facey in York. He's written in asking, I've noticed that a number of riders have negative totals in the point standing. How does this happen? There's a few of them, isn't there, Chris? We just looked and Pavel Padronos from Discovery, he's on negative, and Johan van Zummer, and there's a few of them there. Yeah, they're just actually building up now. Uh, what actually happens is if a rider commits a minor infraction, for example, staying a little bit too long behind one of the team cars when they're coming back up, uh, they'll get three penalties. One will be that they'll get a financial penalty, they'll get some time dot for general classification, and they'll have some points taken away. Now, if they haven't actually got any points, of course, that puts them in a negative situation. Yeah, a bit like that 90 euro speeding fine we got on the way there. But uh, enough of that. I'm surprised to see that so many riders in the Tour are not wearing eye protection. When I rode the Etape du Tour, a bit of showing off there from him, I received several hits from large insects, which could have been very damaging if they'd gone into my eyes. Are there any rules or guidelines about this? What are they, Chris? Well, it's very much personal preference. They've been around for about 20 years now, sunglasses, uh, and they, can't, they have their ups and downs, shall we say. They give you some protection from, obviously, from the glare, small stones, and, of course, insects. But the downside is when you sweat, you sweat on the inside of the lens, you lose some visibility, and that's also not such a good thing. So riders often take them on and off. You often see them perched on the helmets during the climbs. On the climbs, Lance never has the glasses on, but you sometimes see Jan quite often on the flat stages. He always has them on, doesn't he? Yeah, it can give you that little bit of mystique as well. You, all the riders are checking you out, seeing what kind of condition you're in. You can't see the eyes. A little bit of a psychological warfare thing going on there as well. Yeah, you can hide behind them. Right, keep the emails coming. The best way to do that is to go to our website, www.itv.com forward slash Tour de France, and then just follow the prompts. So back to the racing, where that breakaway group of 10 leaders still have an advantage of over 12 and a half minutes on the peloton, 53 kilometres still to race. Well, the guys at the back in that long line are the guys who are under pressure. They're the ones who are having a hard time finishing the Tour de France, having a hard time with the heat and, of course, the undulations on today's stage because this is a very difficult area to race through. And I remember from riding races like the Midi Libre that these roads are really tough roads. You can see still seeing two guys on the front for Discovery Channel. That's Benjamin Noval, the Spanish rider. That in second place there is Pavel Padronos. Next man coming up, Chetu Rubiera. He was in the breakaway yesterday, but he was in the second part of the split. And his teammate Paolo Salvadelli covered the first part of the split and made a fantastic comeback down towards the end. It looked as if he'd lost it with around about 1.2 kilometers to go, but he clawed his way to the back wheel of Kurt Atla Arvison and just managed to overtake him in the closing meters. What beautiful countryside here in the southern part of France. So we're up and it's hard to believe that the majority of this, this hilly area here is hovering at around about the 900 metres, 3,000 feet. And that's where we are. We're just coming through to the town here of the uh, sprint point, which is at Massa Gros, at 51 kilometres to go to the finish. 51 kilometres are still to go to Mond, and that's not that far away as we're heading up now towards the only sprint of the day, and it can only just be up the road here for the group. Again, nobody in this group interested in the small uh, seconds available, not much point, because uh, they're not going to do anything as far as penetrate the leaderboard. 12.34 the gap, they've lost about 10 seconds, that means that uh, 
they're not chasing back there at all not really they've got themselves locked in again it's a very good tactical situation for team discovery who have to say phil since the start of this tour have not really done anything wrong at all they've been in the right place all the time armstrong has never been caught out and when necessary they've always been to they've always been there to defend when required this is carlos de cruz he, he just comes out and pinches everything today because he's won uh, the last two climbs he's now going to win the sprint uh, so that's a hat trick of prizes so he's not sharing anything with the boys he was the rider who started the breakaway and he's pushing on but his team is desperate for some publicity because brad mcgee who really we thought would be a high flyer has had a very disappointing tour i think they're probably desperate for a bit of cash as well because they're well <laughs> down in the rankings for the teams who've won the most money the team who currently have won the most funds out on the road is team discovery channel and that's before you add in the prizes for the overall victory so some of the lesser teams like team francaise de jeu really got to try and pick up a bit of cash on stages like this well armstrong alone will help himself to uh, around about a quarter of a million euros which is a lot of bread to say the least um as a victory there it's for the first place of course the prize which has been reserved <laughs> for him ever since 1999 peloton at 12:33 now and this is the peloton as they're heading up towards the top still of the cote de boyne where da cruz has led over there and since then He's led over the top of the, well, not led over the top, but led through the finishing uh, uh, straight here. A quarter of a million dollars, which is around about 400, no, 400,000 euros is the first prize. I've just got the prize list out now. That's an awful lot of money. 500,000 dollars. Five and half a million dollars for Lance. So yeah. not bad at all. And that's what he'll be looking at at the end of this three-week race. And they'll be looking at a little bit more than that as well, because they're almost certainly here going to win themselves the overall prize for the best young rider. And if things go according to plan, they've still got a very good chance of taking the team classification. Although I think today, T-Mobile making a, a bit of a strong comeback after a bad tactical error yesterday. Inside 50 kilometers now, the gap we're going up again at 12.43. The peloton about 800 meters from the top of the Côte de Boyne. The white jersey we see occasionally down there with the yellow and green band around it is the national champion of Australia. That's Robbie McEwen. And normally you would not see Robbie in this group on the climb so that indicates to us these boys are taking it easy well it also indicates to me that robin McEwen has come through the mountains of the alps and the pyrenees in pretty good form he's ridden sensibly made sure that he's got into the right groups in the big hills not used and expended too much energy because he always said that he wants to win the final stage on the champs elysees and that's a great thing for a sprinter to do it's the equivalent of winning alpe d'huez when you're a climber or the mont ventoux the sacred cobblestones of the Champs Elysees, yeah. and I have to say it is one of the most beautiful sprints in the world. Still counting the clock as they head up towards the summit here, and it's approaching uh, 13 minutes the gap as Benjamin Noval of Team Discovery paces up Pavel Padronos, and uh, nobody, it looks like Santiago Botero off to the right in the Fonac colours. There's the flag of line of Flanders, Belgian flag is that. And uh, the output of Benjamin Oval has dropped down a little bit now, so he's really not making any huge effort. 276 watts. Well, I could do that. Well, yeah, you probably could, but not after three weeks of bike racing like this. <laughs> and this yeah. boy has been putting out this wattage field since the start of the Tour de France. Every day we've seen him on the front end of the main field. Pavel Padrinos and Benjamin Noval have done an awful lot of work. And as soon as they get to the top, you notice a lot of hands being thrown up there. Mauro that Fachi. was, in fact, Mauro Facci. He was waiting for the team car to come forward because he wants to take on board a few drinks. Hi, I'm Cedric Vasser. Keep on watching more Tour de France after... Fifteen kilometers left to race. The break is still out front. And Lance Armstrong's only concern is getting 50 euros on the winner. I think Axel will win. We'll see if Lance is right in a couple of minutes after this from Ned. Now, the Tour de France is a vast travelling circus. Four and a half thousand people in all. Riders, riggers, caterers, organisers, the media, the caravan, the TV crews and the journalists. All of them, with the obvious exception of TV crews and journalists, who are clearly just here for the free cheese and wine, vital to the running of the whole event, without whom the whole thing would come grinding to a halt. Forget for a second the heroics of the riders themselves. How about this for bravery? One of the scariest moments on this year's tour was when a T-Mobile mechanic leant out of his team car and cut off a loose transponder from Alexander Vinokurov's rear wheel. One slip and he would have lost his fingers. Simple as that. And this was the man who did it. Stefan is his first name. Ulrich, his second. Yes, it's Jan's brother. 
Ja gut, meine, wir sind hier im Radrennen und im Radrennen hält man nicht an. Ne? Wer hier anhält, der verliert meistens. Und das war die Situation gewesen, dass ähm, Vinokurov vorne in der Spitzengruppe war, der den ganzen Tag vorne gefahren ist äh, und mit äh, Butero jetzt äh, praktisch um den Etappensieg kämpfte. Und da war es eigentlich die einzige Möglichkeit, den Transponder irgendwie abzuschneiden. Was für ein Tempo ist er gefahren? Ja, ich gehe mal von 60 km aus. 60? 60, 60 65 km, ja. Hast du nicht Angst? Angst? Ähm, nö. Ja, mehr um Vino, weil, äh, wie gesagt, es war äh, der Etappensieg in Frage gestellt. Und ähm, da hatte ich eigentlich keine Angst mehr. He's just Not too far away now as we leave the main highway here, which is directly into Mond for the back roads. Just under 15 kilometers to go. And we're looking now for the third category climb, which is the Côte de Chabry. Martinez comfortably moving up into second place there behind Zandio of Il Baleares in the multicolored sort of pink and white and green jersey. Now this is the movement, Carlos de Cruz. Now, this is a surprise because Carlos de Cruz is probably the, the least best climber in this group, but he's the man who's been on the attack the most, and they haven't reacted. Now, that's a surprise. The Kessler says, come on, let's get organized. Let's not let one man ride off the front in a moment like this. Now, this reminds me of the attack by his teammate, Christophe Mongin, and that seems like months away. And that attack was when we were going down onto the outskirts of Nancy. 13 kilometers to go. We should have predicted De Cruz would start it. He was the first man to launch the attack this morning after 40 kilometers. They all joined him and now he's gone again. Well, this is the best move that he could think of doing because of that leading group of 10, Phil, he is the least best climber and that's why he's taken advantage. He's hoping there's going to be a little bit of tactical maneuvering in this group. As you can see, they've continued to organize themselves, but the group is now starting to pick up passengers as we get to the more difficult part of the course. And as we go to the back of the group, you could see the weaker riders. And Thomas Vukler, I thought they're one of the weaker riders. Luke Roberts is still in contact. He's keeping a very close eye on affairs. Great to see him in the last week of the Tour de France, actually in the breakaway in his first first time participation. Well, looking at De Cruz there, he's a rider that doesn't win many races, but he has shown us this year he has tremendous form in the Tour de France, and he's been attacking and attacking. Nothing to show for it yet. It's his fourth Tour de France. He's always finished this race. Looking there at uh, De Cruz, though, as the pavement artists have been at work again. Very tasteful, too. Tour de France, Tour de France, Tommy Louis. As the riders now continue, the Devils left his mark there with the Trident as well. And here comes the chase. Good tempo riding. Uh, but no reaction really to the attack of de Cruz. Well, I think I might not be too far from the truth with what I said about the Frenchman. Thomas Buckler is sitting at the back of the group, and Cedric Vasseur is doing absolutely nothing at the front end of this group either, waiting to see whether or not de Cruz gets caught, and then they'll try and launch a counter -trick. After all, the French only have one stage victory to their credit so far, and uh, we'll always get a streaker somewhere along the roads of the Tour. It is interesting to see that Team CSC are starting to really whip up the pace. I think they want to toughen the race because, you know, it doesn't matter the fact that this group is 15 minutes behind. The time is important for all of the riders in the top 10 in the overall classification because they feel that there could be a major sort out. Well, they want Basso to get in the split, of course. Ivan Basso, 2 minutes 46 behind Lance Armstrong. Uh, but more importantly, 23 seconds ahead of Rasmussen. Look at this action now. Well, this is Zandia who set it up, but that tall, lanky figure going straight over the top is Merck. Axel Merck. So maybe 
just maybe Ar Lance Armstrong's prediction is going to come true here because Merckx is in great form. He's made the junction there almost immediately. A little bit of confusion as he caught Carlos de Cruz and Cedric Vasseur just sitting a little bit further back. The order over the top was da Cruz, Merckx, Zandio, and they waited till they were over the top. As you can see, the climb continues here. And so too does Axel Merckx. And this is the climb before the big one. And it is very, very steep as we head towards Mon now. We'll descend into the town from here. Well, Axel Merckx, you know, Phil, is not the biggest winner of professional bike races. He's only won 12 races in his career. But whenever he wins a race, and this is how to go from the front to the back in one easy lesson. Shame. Carlos de Cruz, that was all he could do, Phil. He's not a great climber, but at least he's tried. This is the big battle behind Serrano is the man leading the chase behind Axel Merckx. As I was saying, Axel doesn't win many races, but when he does, they're all class acts. He's been the champion of Belgium, like Dad was, and Merckx now making his bid. They're reorganizing there, and here comes Voicle. It had to come. And who's going to go after him? Serrano, yes. Vasseur, yes. Not too sure about Zandio. He looks a bit shaky, hanging on. Well, Zandio was the man who set up the move initially, and it was Axel Merckx who went onto Zandio's wheel and countered over the top. Thomas Vukler has got the gap. Now, this is unbelievable. This is the man who was the darling of France last year, and he is pulling himself inside out. He's almost across the gap there to Axel Merckx. Merckx won't be too happy, because I think he would be a lot happier if he was riding on alone. Well, there we are, over the top of the climb. It's Merckx now, and followed by Vukler. And these boys are going to have to take chances. This is a bit of a twisty old descent down here to Mond, and then we cross the town, and that hill's got nothing on what we are about to see. A good move by Voigtle there. He's caught Axel Merckx. Two of them clear. Hello, I am Nicolas Jalabert. More for the tour after this break. The Tour de France on ITV, sponsored by Michelo Baltra. Welcome back. Axel Merckx and Thomas Verkler had made their break when we left you. They've now been rejoined by Xavier Zandio, Marcus Serrano and Cedric Vasseur. So there are five men heading towards the final climb up to the finish in Mont. Well, the five are together. A little bit of common sense prevailing there because we're now in the town of Mont. We'll turn right shortly. It is going uphill already. We will make a right turn. That's the five kilometer banner across the road. Zandio, Merckx, Serrano. We saw the five names briefly there through the trees and there's a right turn top of the road and then it really does get quite steep this and it continues well Axel Merckx those long gangly legs here stamping watch how quickly the town of Mon drops away from the riders on this climb there's a few bends on the way too Serrano there just threw his bottle to one side he knows there's only about three and a half kilometers to go to the finish and he knows that's an extra 500 meters Merckx. here's Merckx going Merckx has just decided to turn the screw and see can anybody Serrano was quick uh, You see how he took the outside of the corner. That's actually the smoothest part. Oh little Thomas Vogler there He took the inside of the corner, which is the steepest part. So he's obviously in pretty good shape Cedric Vasseur at the back number 128. He doesn't look too bad either Well this right hand bend coming up the riders really need to go to the left of it because it kicks up to about 25% on the inside and if they're wise they'll stay wide here they're going through, Merckx takes them through, and they're going a little bit wide. As Merckx looks to who's got the... See, a Voikler working so hard there, he's gone the tough way round, believe me. He went the tough way round on the inside. It's so much steep, steeper on the inside of the curves on the slope of this climb. But look at Merckx again, accelerating, Phil. He wants the win. How many accelerations has uh, Axel Merckx got in those legs? This one is a serious move now. Voikler is digging his deep, but they're all hanging in there. Everybody is hanging good for the moment. Vukla closes the gap down to Axel Merckx, but it has put this man, Zandio, into a spot of bother. He can't follow the pace, and we've still got around about a and kilometre Pelizzotti and a half to go. Now, that's a surprise to me. Pelazotti can't follow. Pelazotti, who just got back, hasn't recovered. They've got rid of him. Now we're down to three, four. Four men are down to at the moment. There were six in the escape. An attack immediately here, coming from uh, Marcus Serrano. Merckx has taken his back wheel. There are four riders left here in this group. The other is Cedric Vasseur, and for the moment, and he's gone. Thomas Voigtler, I'm not sure he's got it now. 
Well, he's attacked on a number of occasions. He's been the hero of this early forming of the breakaway. The man who is looking the calmest in this group is actually Cedric Vasseur. And I'll tell you one thing, if they don't get rid of Cedric Vasseur before the summit, he's probably the man who's got the fastest turn of speed up the line here towards the finish on the velodrome, on the aerodrome. It may as well be a velodrome because it is extremely hard up here. But uh, Vasseur looks as though he is actually just waiting here. It's waiting to move. They know the odds are really against Merckx if he doesn't get rid of them for the sprint. It's a very fast sprint onto the aerodrome. Yeah, it's rather interesting that uh, Axel Merckx, the son of Eddie Merckx, has never won a stage in the Tour de France, although he has emulated his dad by winning a stage in the Giro d'Italia, and he has been the Belgian national champion. Serrano now, Phil, wants to put the pressure on this group. I think they're a little bit worried by the presence of Cedric Vasseur there. I would be worried too, and the power of the French on his shoulders now, because only one stage win so far, and let's not forget, rather, it was Vasseur's teammate, David Moncoutier, who won on Bastille Day, and now Coffert is looking for a second win, and Vasseur looking very cool, and Dad Alain, I'm sure, is crowding the television set right now. He was a pro in the Tour de France as well. And this is a Credit Agrico rider. I don't think there's going to be too much to worry about this. It'll start the ball rolling, though, from Das Kashikin. Kashikin trying to threaten and maybe make Yaroslav Popovic tremble a fraction. I don't think there's going to be any trembling on Team Discovery Channel. Marco Serrano, though, Phil, has still got a slight advantage. It doesn't look very much on the slopes of a hill like this, but if you were to flatten the course out, that gap would probably be about 50 metres, and he's still going away. Serrano has still got a very nice pedalling action there, and you can see how difficult it is for the two guys in second and third place. And as the crowds part their ways, Marcus Serrano of Liberty Seguros is fighting here because this is the team of Joshiba Baloka, remember? Joshiba's done a solid ride, but nothing like the rides we've seen in the past from him since he had that bad crash. 15 seconds he's got, 12 and 3 quarter minutes to the peloton, we can get those for a moment. But look at his face, Phil, he's got his tongue out, he's gasping for air, he knows right now he's within around about a minute and 15 seconds of a stage win in the Tour. Now he's nearly at the summit of the climb, and he's about one and a half kilometres from the finish. He's going to be first over the top of the Côte de Long Jalabert, then it's downhill and onto the flat of the aerodrome. Well, I like the way you call it flat. When I looked down this aerodrome, it looked as if it was tilting downhill quite a bit to me, and it will be when this man gets to it, because after all, this stage has been 189 kilometres in length, and the final kilometre really does drag up at an average gradient of around about 5%. These are the two chasers, and the gap to the two chasers is not really very much more than 10 or 12 seconds, but I think the way Serrano was going there, Phil, he must have it in the bag. Wise man, just see if you can see Axel Merckx or Cedric Vasseur before you swing into the straight, up to the biggest gear he possesses, onto the aerodrome. Let's hope he's got permission to land. Here he comes. <laughs> well, he's coming in for landing now. He's on final approach as he comes into this aerodrome finish line. You know, he has a man, as a man, finished ninth overall in the Tour de France. So this is a man of serious quality. And when you get to this point, the body, Phil, I can tell you, is screaming out to stop, but he's pushing it above and beyond the call of duty. Huge moments, and now's the chance to wave because he's checked out the opposition. And this is a big, big moment for Marcus Serrano, trying since 1998. He's eighth Tour de France, and the first victory this year for the team which dominated the early part of the season, but haven't done anything in the Tour de France until today. Now the sprint for second place here. Uh, I'm sure Cedric Pasteur will try to take Axel Merckx on, but they've come off so quickly. Here he comes. He's a good sprinter. He'll be kicking himself because he's allowed a Spanish rider to slip away. Second for Pasteur, third for Axel Merckx. Well, it was easy in the end for Marcos Serrano, but only because he did the hard work at the right time on the climb. The remains of the breakaway filled the top six places, with Axel Merckx for the second time this tour putting in a long day's work out front with only the consolation of being in the proximity of a stage win. Yeah, it's not enough, eh? close, it's not enough. So, uh, I think the tour is, is over for me now. I think, I think tomorrow I can do it again. I think it was a long day today, it was hard. And uh, I think I played my, my game today and uh, Serrano was just stronger. Well, behind Axel, this stage isn't over yet. The group containing Lance Armstrong and the other big names is just hitting the slopes of the newly named Monte Laurent Jalabert. 
Basso Phil making a move. Well, this may be why CSC tried to set it up. Look at this now. Where's Jan Ulrich? He's got to answer this one. Uh, Armstrong is right there waiting for the move. He's hooked up straight away. Ulrich is the rider behind, but he's got to have a quick reaction. He hasn't got it yet. Actually, the man behind Mancebo. is Cadell Evans Cadell coming Evans across there. That's a big good move. move. There is Ulrich. There is Alexander Vinokurov. This is the big sorting out of the top 10 places in the overall classification at the tour because Ivan Basso here has decided he wants to have the big sort out. Well, Cadell Evans with a 15 second gain over Vinokurov would be up a place tonight. And that's why Vinokurov is trying to hitch on here. Jan Ulrich looking where his teammate is because this all of a sudden is once more a battle of the strength. Basso followed by Armstrong, Cadell Evans. The pace has slowed a little bit because Ulrich is on. And now uh, Vinokurov is on, but once again, Paul, uh, Floyd Landis and uh, um, Leipheimer not there and where is Michael Rasmussen well I'm just looking down the road and that's what this is all about here is Michael Rasmussen with Levi Leipheimer Leonardo Pipoli and Francisco Mancebo the gap is not much but as you can see the attack there by Ivan Basso and Armstrong is doing damage this is huge for Ulrich now so four men forming at the front and I tell you what Cadell Evans could see himself moving up again in the overall classification here this afternoon because he has hitched on there he is in third place Ivan Basso look at his face here he wants to get as much time as possible over everybody else in the race he's not too worried I don't think about the position of Lance Armstrong here is Rasmussen he's got to pull himself back in he's in company there of Levi Leipheimer Francisco Mancebo this is only a small climb it's only the three kilometer finishing climb here on today's stage of the tour but it is having a serious effect on the top end of the overall classification Basso on the red left Cadell Evans is there Armstrong in the middle takes control of the pacemaking Jan Ulrich has managed to stay there but this man Alexander Vinokurov is probably going to fall behind Cadell Evans again because the climb I think is just a little bit too steep for the Kazakh champion looking a bit further back there is Rasmussen oh when your legs go on a climb like this it's bridge to edge and room more power but there isn't any more power there for Alexander Vinokurov and the gap is opening well, it's a very steep climb, Paul. We're talking the seconds for the podium in Paris, and this was the place when they're giving their all. Look how far down the valley is now. Oh, this is a beast of a climb. Look way down there in the bottom. That's where we have come from. That is Mon. And if you look way down in the bottom of the picture, you can see Alexander Vinokurov. Everybody here throwing caution to the wind. Jan Ulrich, Phil, today wants to get a little bit more time on Michael Rasmussen. He probably was a little bit worried about the fact that there was three minutes between him and a podium position. And today he's looking for third place in the Tour de France. He's not going to worry Lance Armstrong. Look at Armstrong dancing on the pedals. This is the last time he was going to dance up a mountain like this in the Tour de France because there's no big climbs tomorrow to talk about. The neutral service cars are moving forward. Levi Leipheim has got to defend his position. Well, the he situation was sixth at the start of today. Le Leipheimer is looking a little bit in distress there, to say the least. So is Rasmussen. This is a huge escape for Cadell Evans in the middle because he's moving up one place now. The rider who'll lose that is number 19, Vinokurov. Uh, but what Jan Ulrich is doing is making his job in the time trial that much easier. He won't get the time back today on Rasmussen, but he won't have to take so much out of him in the time trial on Saturday. And this is a big coup on what is not really a very long climb. Armstrong just controlling, keeping an eye on the man closest to him in the overall classification. Number 21 there, Ivan Basso. We are looking at the fight here for the podium in Paris, the top three places. And it is so good to see Cadell Evans feel bouncing back. He was the one who reacted to the attack of Basso and Armstrong and immediately came up there to join them. Well, Levi Leipheimer is in sixth place, uh, but he's got time in hand, nearly two minutes more plus over Cadell Evans, so he's not in any desperate straits just yet. It looks as if Jan Ulrich might be having a spot of bother here. And look at Cadell Evans. He's still in contact, Phil, with the two top men in the overall standings of the tour. Ivan Basso in first place, Lance Armstrong in second. And look at Jan Ulrich again, caught a little bit behind the rest on the steepest part of the climb towards the finish. He's been distanced here. Cadell Evans hangs on to the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong. This is the driving face of Ivan Basso, who's consolidating right now his overall position because he's worried about the time trial of Ulrich, and he's getting a few seconds that might be vital. 
It's all about seconds for the other places in the overall standings at the Tour de France here. And Jan Ulrich knows that. He's got look at Jan He's pulling back. himself back. He is coming back despite the effort of Ivan Vasso. Vasso, look at the face. He's grimacing. People say, who is the heir apparent to the throne of Lance Armstrong? Well, I think we're actually looking at him here. He is not afraid at all of Armstrong, and he's very prepared to attack. Well, there's still over three minutes between Basso and Ulrich, in the, and that now is going to be decided in the time trial. Jan Ulrich, in his last ten days of the tour, has shown us once again he is a fighter. He's a fighter, he's a battler. He rode that last 700 metres of that climb, Phil, on what the French would call pure courage. He pulled himself inside out. He wanted to stay in contact with these men. He wants to climb onto the podium of the Tour de France when Armstrong wins on Sunday, because I'm sure now he is going to win on Sunday. Jan Ulrich wants to be there with him. And I tell you what, Jan might well try for the sprint here because this is a matter of honour now. There is Michael Rasmussen. He's been in that jersey ever since the mountains began. He is losing time and it's crucial he doesn't lose much because Ulrich will finish him off in the time trial and he will be the third man in the tour then. Well, as our commissaire tries to get us out the way from the back car there, Armstrong has taken control over the top. That's over the top of the climb. There's around about one and a half kilometers to go to the finish. They'll get some respite here as they drop down to the bottom of the aerodrome and then they'll take that left-hand turn and start to climb up. Not quite the same pressure in this group, being led by Levi Leipheimer, second there, Michael Rasmussen and Alexander Vinokurov. But this, beside the fact that it's only been a three-kilometer climb again, Phil, it has caused some serious damage. And this is the sprint for the line, and I'm wondering if Cadell will try here. But look at the power of Lance. Lance Armstrong as he drives onto the Mond runway. This is the lineup now for the for the finish. Well, it's almost 10 minutes and 49 seconds since Marcos Serrano actually won the stage, but it's this battle behind, and it's amazing these riders, Phil, are battling out for seconds. They're not slowing down. They're sharing turns at the front, ah. just keeping the pressure on because the race is all about seconds for the placings in the overall standings. They can't even raise the spin past Armstrong here. They're letting him go over the line in first place. Hang on to his shirt. Here comes Cadell Evans. This man is finishing the tour strong and he's going to climb one place in the overall tonight. He needs just 15 seconds and he's already got five as I speak. And there's nobody. Here comes the man he's going over. Alexander Vinokurov and Rasmussen is losing time, quite a lot of time really, to Jan Ulrich, although he will keep his third place tonight but for how much longer he will keep his third place tonight but it is starting to tremble quite a fraction phil he's had to get onto the front to do all of the pace making up the finishing line here francisco mancebo has come back to this group i don't know where he came from but that is a bad loss of time for michael rasmussen it is huge as they hit the line 36 seconds they have lost there that is a big loss of time and we're only three days from the finish of the tour de france Indeed it was, rounded up to 37 seconds in the end, and those seconds may end up costing Michael Rasmussen third overall. The stage, though, belonged to the strongest man on the last proper climb of this year's tour, Marcos Serrano. El ciclismo nada está escrito y puede aparecer en cualquier sitio y yo hoy por la mañana salía con una intención de intentar coger una escapada como salía el día de San Larí, de, de Obisque, que lo intenté a contracorriente todo el día y mira, hoy salió y la escapada y la victoria, increíble. Now let's see what that final climb did to the overall standings and it's third place we're talking about, the right to stand on the podium in Paris. Now Michael Rasmussen has slipped back to 3 minutes 46 behind Armstrong but what's important is that he's now only 2 minutes 12 ahead of Jan Ulrich going into Saturday's time trial where the German should be much faster. Other than that, Australia's Cadell Evans played his daily game of intercontinental leapfrog with Kazakhstan's Alexander Vinokurov. He's seventh again and Vino's eighth. Floating above all the scrabbling for the minor places, though, is Armstrong. About his only weakness seems to be prognostication. He got the winner wrong today, picking Axel Merckx. Ned tested him again as he came off the podium. Lance, the GC is sort of sorting itself out now. Let's have a wild prediction from you. Who do you think is going to be on the podium alongside you in Paris? Uh, Basel second, Ulrich third. Simple as that? Simple. Michael's ro Michael Rasmussen has, has rode bravely, though, hasn't he? He definitely, definitely rode bravely, and uh, I don't know why. I, I, it's, uh, it's tough to say because I don't know exactly what happened today, but I suspect maybe he was with us. No. He wasn't with us. He wasn't with us. I should know these things, but 
Um, I, th I think that those 30 seconds will be probably the 30 that knocks him off the podium, unfortunately for him. But he's rode, he's rode a great race. I mean, if you consider the breakaway uh, early in the race, which was incredibly impressive, and then to never lose time in the high mountains, chapeau. Not a bad day then overall for Michael Rasmussen, a chapeau from the race leader, and almost forgotten because of the time he lost on that final climb, finally confirmed as King of the Mountains, the first jersey of the Tour to be definitively tied up. Michael, uh, should we be congratulating you or commiserating? You've won the King of the Mountains, but you've lost 30 seconds on Jan Ulrich. Um, well, I'll say you should congr congratulate me. Uh, since uh, I achieved uh, the second uh, goal that I came with here, um, so I don't think many riders say they come here with two objectives and, and achieve both of them. Um, so I'm, I'm relieved that I'll be on the podium in Paris regardless. Now then, we filled the final spot on our podium tonight. The final competition winner's name is on the flight list for Paris and it's Jackie Sackville of High Wycombe. Five runners up, we'll get DVD highlights of the race. Right, tomorrow is another lumpy looking stage. In fact, there's almost nothing flat in the final week until we hit the Champs-Élysées. Pretty short though, 153 kilometers from Issoire to the spectacular volcanic town of the puy en velay I can't imagine Lance will get the chance to do any sightseeing though. He keeps trying to sit serenely in the bunch, but they just won't let him. And tomorrow looks like being another lively day. See you at seven for highlights of stage 19.